Well, we are looking forward to a great afternoon out. There are five male cheetah. We're in the Masai Mara. This is Safari Live. Well, what a beautiful sight this is. Five male cheetah, a coalition that we are beginning to get to know and are really enjoying spending time with. We found them at about 11.30, so about four and a half hours ago, and they've just been sleeping in the shade of this tree. They haven't had too many visitors, although one zebra did come past, huff and puff a little bit and then continued on. So it'll be interesting to see what time they decide to get up. They look like they've got quite full bellies. I'm not sure when last they made a kill. The last confirmed kill I heard about was actually on Saturday afternoon. I'm sure they've been successful since then, judging by their bellies. And also judging by the fact that from what we've heard, these guys are incredible successful hunters and we've already managed to see three takedowns all within kind of 24 hours spent with them so a very formidable coalition not too much prey around in the immediate area but that could change at any moment we're in a little it's kind of slight valley and this is interestingly not too far away from where we saw them make a kill last week friday morning they crossed a small riverbed which is just behind us and I fear they may actually want to cross that riverbed and head to the northern parts of their territory to go and check in to make sure there's no intruders there. They've been in the southern parts of their territory for about a week now. So I think they're heading north to check on things up there which means we'll have an exciting river crossing to try and work our way through in order to stay with them. You'll be glad to know that it's not just myself out this afternoon. Brent is also heading out in another part of the Masai Mara. He's going to be a little bit closer towards camp, probably looking to spend some time with the Angama Pride, I guess, or I guess you'll just have to wait and see what exactly his plans are. But he's basically on the western side of the Mara River, and we've come across onto the eastern side of the Mara River. We took about a two and a half hour drive to get into this area this morning and took us probably another two hours to find these boys but with the help of some of the guides and other vehicles that are driving around this area we have eventually managed to work out where they were and I'm told a lot of you guys are really really ecstatic about the fact that we've got some cheetah on screen it's probably the least viewed cat on Safari Live but we look to change that now that we're in an area with more cheetah now, I did mention that Brent is also going to be out a little bit later. There's also Ali, who's going to be driving around in a different reserve in South Africa called the Sabi Sands. And that's a great place to see leopard. So who knows? We could see two of our spotted cats this afternoon if we're lucky. Hello to James. You're wondering if uh, when cheetah are greeting one another, will they purr? And I have spent very little time with cheetah, James, so I'm actually not too sure of that. And I personally have not heard any cheetah purring. They've got quite interesting audio that they make. So it almost sounds like birds chirping. And it's something that I'd really like to actually listen to a lot more and get to work out because, like I said, I'm a bit of a rookie when it comes to cheetahs, to be honest. Interestingly, one of the cheetah researchers who does spend quite a lot of time with these five males has a huge microphone that she's been recording all of their audio communications with. And she's trying to analyze and work out what it is exactly that they are saying to one another. Um, I've only had brief encounters with her. Um, so looking forward to spending a little bit more time with her and working out what's what. Now on the horizon there is a potential snack for these boys just to the right there, to the right of the tree. Now it's a long way off now 
but anything could happen. That's a Thompson's Gazelle, and I'm not too sure if these guys will actually be hugely interested in Thompson's Gazelle because I think they have kind of specialized in hunting wildebeest. But the beauty of being out here is that you simply do not know what is going to happen at any moment, so there is some possible prey that could stir these boys up. Or they may, might just decide to go down for a drink in the riverbed that's just behind us, about 100 or 200 meters away. I'm certainly looking forward to seeing what they get up to a little bit later. It's only a matter of time until they get up. Hello to Enid, who would like to know a little bit about, more about what would happen had had these boys decide to go and chase down a Thompson's gazelle or any other prey? Will they hunt as a team? Um, I guess they will. Um, I, in it, I personally think people give uh, predators far too much credit um, regarding their strategies and planning with hunting. Um, and that's just my personal opinion. Often people will try and, you know, draw angles and lines and use these big fancy words to explain how the lions are closing in on prey with these precise pincer movements but it's very very seldom like that or at least for as far as i've seen and with these five boys what i've noticed is that it's more likely that there's going to be one of them that's the main hunter and the best hunter and stalker and chaser and as far as i'm aware he is the male with the collar on one of these males does have a collar on so we'll show him to you a bit later but he seems to be the leader of the pack Dave's going in to show, show him now. And all three kills that have been made in the time that we have seen them make kills, it's been him with the others following behind. Now that's not to say that he could chase one and another one could assist in the hunt, but I think it's more through default than kind of planned teamwork. They all just run after the best possible prey item and if they're all chasing the same one through de default, then I guess it is teamwork. And there's no two ways about it. Having five of them together will increase their chances of bringing down prey, especially once the lead hunter has managed to latch onto it. So in this case, that individual who's got his head up now will be the one who maybe leads the charge, makes the initial contact with the prey, and then the other four come in and add muscle to the situation and try and help bring down larger prey items like fully grown wildebeest, which is quite a mouthful for these guys to take on quite a handful for these guys to take on yet they do it so yes there is teamwork but I just feel that quite often people <laughs> overanalyze or overemphasize the skill of the predators whereas to be honest it's the skill of the prey who nine times out of ten escape them Hello to Aaron, you would like to know how often will unrelated cheetahs join up to form coalitions? And I think it happens fairly commonly, Aaron. Even this coalition here, we are told, one of the members joined most recently, the smallest one, who I think is the one that is closest to us, just in front of the, the yeah, well, the front one there. It's very difficult to tell them apart, but I think he is the smallest. And what one of the researchers told us is that if cheetah within 20 to 24 months of age come across another, so basically two years of age, if they come across another coalition of males, they can be accepted into it. They may, may get their fur a little bit ruffled up and there may become some kind of a skirmish initially, but if they are young enough, they can be accepted into a coalition. If they get older than two years or X age, then it'll become less and less likely for bigger established coalitions to accept younger males. So, again, I think a lot is left unsaid, even within, you know, with all the researchers out there. There's a lot of missing gaps in terms of information on various populations, and populations in different areas behave differently. But the more we, time we spend here, and with all your guys' help, identifying the different animals and keeping tabs on them and who's who and where they're moving, it'll certainly help us work out what happens with the future coalitions that may join or disband in this area.
Hello to Laura. You would like to know if this coalition has a name. And we are going, we are tr trying to tread lightly with regards to names of animals at this stage because we just don't want to make any mistakes. So what you often find in most wilderness areas you go to is that one camp or one group of guides may call a coalition X name and the other camp down the stream or the other team of guides may call the same coalition something else. And we're not too sure exactly how many names there may be. We've already got misleading information for the name of the guy with the collar on. We were told it was Hunter by one person and Dartonian by another. <laughs> so we're still trying to work out who's who. But yes, the name, or one of the names I've heard of this coalition is called the Musketeers. That in itself can be confusing because there's also a coalition of lion in the Mara called the Musketeers. I guess a coalition of lion and cheetah are quite easily distinguishable though. But that's the state at the moment, the state of things. And you'll be happy to know that you're about to be transported to one of our very strategically positioned river cams, who Steph is going to be driving around. Hello and welcome to this afternoon's river cam session all the way here from the Mara River. And that horrible scene that you're having a look at over there is a bunch of crocodiles that have got a wildebeest that they are busy dismembering. Now, where they got this wildebeest, I have no idea. They're, I've been watching this river cam the whole afternoon, and unless a wildebeest came floating down, which is, I think, what may have happened, um, they definitely didn't catch it here. Quite often what happens is wildebeest will drown, they will uh, fall victim to other crocodiles upstream, perhaps even leopard or a lion, dropped this carcass in the water. I'm not too sure exactly how this carcass happened, but the fact is that the crocodiles in this particular pool uh, have managed to zone in on this carcass and are now pulling it to pieces. Now, of course, crocodiles can't chew. Have a look at that crocodile in the center of your screen. You'll notice when he opens up his mouth that there are no molars there. They also, look at this crocodile coming up with big teeth rips it out to the side with slash, comes out of the water, and then swallows it down. Deliberately coming out of the water so they don't fill their tummies with, with water itself. We may even see, look at that roll. That is the only way that crocodiles can dismember a carcass. And look at that. Rips off a piece and comes straight in. The rest of the crocodiles now coming in. Isn't this fantastic? Now, you may have noticed that there was a little... Uh, banner that came across the screen there that says live from the Masamara and that is exactly it just like Scott is with those cheetah this is happening right now on the Mara River here in southern Kenya in the Mara Triangle this group of crocodiles busy tearing to pieces a wildebeest now yeah, look at that oh now yesterday we had about 10,000 wildebeest perhaps even more than that cross the river a little bit downstream of this particular crossing and what we saw was zero crocodile activity what we think it is about is because the temperature the the water temperature and the temperature of the atmosphere has a huge impact on the activity of crocodiles and below 20 degrees centigrade crocodiles become virtually inactive this is obviously not the same today it's been a pretty warm day today and you can see that these crocodiles are absolutely not inactive, gulping down massive chunks of meat, and those are some enormous reptiles. We're looking at crocodiles upwards. That one on the right-hand side there is probably upwards of 12 to 15 feet. Look at them coming all the... Oh, excuse me. There we go. There's some birds that are looking for some scraps. That is just me being a little bit ambitious with the controls. And... Um, is a pied kingfisher that just flew into the into the, the view. Now, crocodiles, generally speaking, don't really eat fresh meat. Now, this is generally speaking. In the Mara River, and especially after waiting almost an entire year for food, these crocodiles will eat fresh meat. Of course they will. But it seems to be the fact that most of these crocodiles will wait for carcasses to rot a little bit, making it easier for them to dismember and, of course, tear into pieces like you're watching them do right now. Oh. 
Now, oh, hi, Bacon, you've just asked if crocodiles will feed on carcasses that they didn't themselves kill. Absolutely. They, this carcass, in all likelihood, floats it down into this pool. The crocodiles in this pool zoned in on the smell of it. It is sufficiently decayed as to be uh, relatively soft, potentially. It is still the early season. These crocodiles have lost a little bit of weight over the last couple of months, waiting for the migration to come in, and so they will eat fresh meat. And now what they're doing is they're having a, a feeding frenzy, basically. But unlike you see of sharks or lions or even a hyena, I find that there's a certain balance. Just look at the power of that crocodile. Look at how enormous that guy is. That's a full-grown wildebeest, and that crocodile made the front quarters. Look at the head on that guy. That is amazing. There are a couple of giant crocodiles there. Look at how long that crocodile is. Just how he dwarfs the actual branch. One of the biggest crocodiles in this pool. Quite easy, could pull down a 400 pound wildebeest on his own. Obviously a little bit hungry right now. I've seen a picking order to these feeding frenzies. The biggest crocodiles get the, get the most food. Other crocodiles, smaller crocodiles and females, hang around on the periphery and snatch what they can. And there is no evidence of baby crocodiles in these pools. You're not seeing, you're only seeing big crocodiles like that giant over there. You're not seeing small crocodiles. I've got a funny feeling it's because small crocodiles will be preyed on by these big guys. And they, the smaller crocodiles have to make space and basically go and live in other places. Here he comes in over the top. Let's see what he's going to go and do. Asserting his dominance over here. Puffing out his throat. This is amazing. Now what makes me think this carcass came down the river is just look where it is. It's caught up on some branches in this eddy, a backwater. And there you can see the horns of the wildebeest. Wow, what an interesting sighting. Now, I don't notice this frenzy. This, this is a bit of a frenzy. I don't notice this on a fresh kill. Look at that mouth open. Isn't that the most terrifying thing? Big crocodile, getting out of the way of another big crocodile. Obviously, that one more dominant, bigger, stronger. Who knows? That bird on the left-hand side, a yellow-billed stalk. Oh, whoa, whoa. What's happening over here? These crocodiles... Having a bit of a fight with one another. That is a big crocodile. Have a look at that. Posturing. Quite often that is the case with these crocodiles. Now, Dennis, you wanted to know how many animals hunt crocodiles. It's a good question, Dennis. It's a pro it's a, I suppose it's the same question as how many animals hunt polar bears or how many animals hunt lion or how many animals hunt great white shark or orca. Not very many. A and that is simply because a crocodile is an apex predator. In this environment, he is or she is, they are the top of the food chain. And only scavengers and parasites and disease and viruses, I suppose, are, are they susceptible to them. And so nothing would hunt a crocodile in its full-grown form. Obviously, as a baby, just similar to sharks and you know, lion and hyena and everything else, they will be preyed upon by almost anything, and anything will take the advantage of killing a baby crocodile just to limit the threat that they pose when they're a little bit older. But nothing in their big form, like this big guy here in the foreground, nothing except other crocodiles, starvation, drought, uh, exposure to extreme temperatures, or uh, both hot and cold, disease, or serious injury, you know, from whatever would actually kill this crocodile. We can relate to that to a degree. Oh, look at the size of these guys. Now this yellow-billed stalk that you're seeing over here in the foreground. Oh, now Taryn, you've asked an interesting question, but first I'm just going to just talk about these birds. These birds are coming downstream of where the kill is, simply because the smell is attracting fish. Both birds, the grey heron in the back and the yellow-billed uh, stalk in the front, are fishing. They're taking a little bit of a chance to out now, looking to catch a fish that is attracted by the feeding of the crocodiles and all the detritus that is coming off of them. Now, Taryn, you wanted to know who would win, a crocodile or an alligator? That is a very, very good question there, Taryn. Um, 
I don't have much, uh, I don't have much uh, knowledge on alligators. I know they've got a stronger bite uh, per kilogram than a crocodile. I know they are virtually identical in all else, um, with the exception that the Nile crocodile can get a little bit bigger in terms of weight, as far as I know, although you're welcome to correct me on that, Taryn. Um, but of course, what we're not talking about is the saltwater crocodile of Australia. And Indonesia, that is the heaviest crocodile and the largest crocodile in the world. And because of that, I'm going to make the statement here that in general, crocodiles, without being too specific about what exact species, would trump alligators in a fight simply because they are bigger and heavier. So I hope that makes some sense to you there, Tone. Now, Tula Ann, who's only five years old, Hello, Tula Ann. You wanted to know, do crocodiles bite each other? Tula Ann, absolutely. They do bite one another. They slash at one another with their teeth. And quite often, you see crocodiles with bite marks on their snouts and on their heads and on their flanks from other crocodiles. And they do that just to assert dominance. If you've been watching this for a little bit, you would have noticed that a very big crocodile just now opened up his mouth and made a slashing attempt at another very big crocodile. And that is just to assert dominance. There will be a hierarchy, and what that means is there will be a boss of this particular pond, and this boss will have the first pickings of all the choice morsels that come down here. But he needs to make sure that everybody else understands that he's the boss. And if he doesn't do that, another big crocodile will take that throne from him. So it's a precarious position. It's a position that changes from time to time, depending on what crocodile is the biggest, what crocodile is the fittest, what crocodile is the strongest or the cleverest? Oh, this is just such a fantastic sighting. Now, Ruby, you're a new viewer. Welcome, Ruby. Welcome to Safari Live. I'm sure everyone will welcome you throughout the afternoon. You wanted to know if the crocodiles got too close to these birds, would they consider eating them or would they be able to eat them? Absolutely, Ruby. Uh, crocodiles are opportunistic. They are carnivorous. To a fault, have a look at this crocodile coming in here. And they will absolutely eat birds. Now, it's funny that a crocodile about a half a meter in length, so about one and a half feet to about three feet in length, will eat birds, fish, and insects as the majority of its diet. As it gets bigger, that, look at this coming in, coming in. He's going to make a snap at it. Oh, no, that bird has seen a crocodile before. Almost, Ruby, you almost got your wish over here. That crocodile's probably just over three or four feet. Now, they will eat insects below three feet, majority insects and fish, then from three feet to about the size of these crocodiles here, mainly just fish. And then when they get to these giant old crocodiles that you're watching in the distance over there, these crocodiles are absolutely just meat eaters, which gives them the largest intake of calories and protein for the least amount of effort. Now, are we watching what happens to the rest of this wildebeest buffet? We're going to be sending you over to, I think, Brent. I'm not too sure. Perhaps Brent has finally found some signal. And uh, we're going to see you in a little bit. Well, here we go with one of the most beautiful and biggest antelopes in Africa, the eland. Now, they range all through the Mara Serengeti system, but we do have a particular fondness for this herd that hangs around the area below our camp. Now, eland are one of my most favorite antelopes. They are absolutely gorgeous. Now, we are just below our camp at the moment, heading out on a live safari. So welcome to everyone. Very exciting to have you all on the back of the world's largest safari vehicle. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have Jean-Ray on camera and I cannot wait to explore the delights that the Maasai Mara has to offer with you on this slightly overcast but very pleasant afternoon here in Kenya. Remember this is 100% live and I would love to hear from you so let me know what you think or if you have any questions by using the hashtag safari live on Twitter. 
and we can hear an aeroplane overhead taking uh, some lucky guests either in or out of one of the fantastic lodges that are all through the Maasai Mara. But now, I think we're going to have, we had such a good morning. Uh, we had lions, we had wildebeest, we had zebra, we had crocodiles, and uh, we had a few bird species. Now I know quite a lot of our regular viewers are itching to get to 50 bird species. Uh, some of you have already passed, and I don't know, has anyone made it to 100 birds yet on their Kenya lists? If you have, hashtag Safari Live, let me know how your Kenya bird list is coming, and I'm gonna try add a few more on that on this gorgeous evening. Now, I can hear what I like to call uh, the, the soundtrack of the Maasai Mara. In almost all places around the Mara, if you stop and keep still, you will hear a rufous naped lark in the distance. I can't see one. Ah, there is one. Uh, you can hear them calling. There he is, sitting atop of the shepherd's tree. Oh, you can hear him calling, you can see him calling. And a very a drab little bird, but he does have a, a slightly reddish cap um, that extends when he's trying to impress the ladies. Well, let's leave the little Rufus named Lark and see what other fantastic things are just down the drag. Now, this is, of course, a prime and gama lion territory, so we could very easily bump into them. Uh, I also thought I might go have a squiz for some black rhino this afternoon, one, another one of my favorites. But the wonderful thing about being on a live safari is you truly never know what is going to happen next. So uh, it's a pleasure to have you all on board, and let's get to it. Shall we? Well, here we go. That's a bit of a better view of some of the eland. Now, James is wondering about the social structure of eland. Uh, it differs slightly uh, from some of the an other antelope, James. Now, uh, they will be in loose female herds, and there will be territorial, well, sorry, not territorial bulls, dominant bulls. Now, eland are not as territorial as certain animals. They tend to move and have seasonal migrations between different areas. So you can have multiple large bulls in a herd and they will fight for the right to breed when a female is in estrus. Other than that, you will often, you can often find females uh, without any dominant males around and it could just be that there are no females in estrus at that point. Now they also breed throughout the year. They are not seasonal breeders. Oh, here we go. For the birders, we've got the yellow bird ox peckers on that young eland. I just really love that sort of reddish color on them. And uh, they are part of the Trafalegid family as a young boy. Now Trafalegids are spiral horned antelopes. And uh, you can see that twisty horn. Now elands are by far the biggest of the spiral horned antelope um, with a big eland bull being able to weigh up to a thousand kilograms, a full ton. And uh, there is a species that occurs in Cameroon in Central Africa uh, and Central, the Central African Republic called the Lord Derby's eland which gets even bigger. Oh we've got one of my favorite little animals up ahead. Yay 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 yay. And they are so fun to watch. They are very much busy, 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 busy bodies. Don't run away, little chaps. Um, and now, strange enough, I was even lucky enough to have a couple of these as pets while growing up. Uh, there is, of course, banded mongoose. And I do absolutely adore spending time with them. Okay, let's have a look. There we're just around this little termite mound here. You got one? jean says he's got them. There we go, they're running up ahead of us. Now, that's it, now wait for it. Going, one is going to pop its head up to make sure there's no danger of it. I'm just gonna slide down the road, can we roll? Because I think they're gonna come out into the open shortly. Now, just for those of you who might be new, remember this is 100% live, unscripted. We can't control what the animals are going to do. Uh, we never know what's going to happen next. There we go. Where are you guys going? You're not supposed to run away. Oh no, they're running away at high speed. Oh dear. Not the friendliest group of banded mongoose then. Well, our banded 
good mongoos are a bit camera shy. Hopefully we'll find some more a little bit later that aren't. Uh, while we do that, uh, let's uh, jump across to Steph. Oh, hang on, just before we go to Steph, just before they're on top of a termite mound, we'll have one quick look before they disappear. Here we go. Hello, little mongoose. Then you make the most wonderful noises. But anyway, he's keeping a lookout for, uh, for the others so they can move and forage and they don't get eaten by an eagle. Okay, now speaking about looking from up above, like that mongoose was watching out for eagle, I should be watching over my shoulder because apparently Steph is spying on me. technology is that we have to work with. This camera is literally above where I'm sitting at the moment and that is the view from my office right now. Isn't that the most amazing thing? There on the right hand side is Angama Mara and they have the same even better view actually over the plains. Now if you wouldn't mind going to cul-de-sac crossing, these crocodiles have managed to dislodge this wildebeest and are now spinning up a storm with a hippo watching. It's just crocodiles are just going crazy at the moment, trying to dismember this, this carcass. Just have a look at that frenzy. I haven't seen crocodiles do this ever, to be honest with you. And as you might have just noticed, this is live. There's a crocodile going off with the leg. A massive crocodile coming in to dismember this carcass. There we go, the death roll, as they call it. Sharks also do it. Crocodile quite aware of what's around smaller crocodile coming in there just wanting to get a little bit of a, a bite obviously not welcome at the at the larger portion of the carcass mainly because these big crocodiles will do them a bit of an injury now as this kill gets to an end these crocodiles will basically just make off with little bits and pieces Cedric, you wanted to know if crocodiles are able to digest and eat the horns absolutely Cedric crocodiles have I don't know if they've got a stronger acid, you know, a more concentrated acid in their tummies than what we would have, for instance, but they definitely seem to be able to digest virtually everything. I would imagine that it's slightly more concentrated or slightly more acidic, and that allows them to digest bones and hooves and hair a little bit more efficiently than anything else would. Um, definitely, they don't cough up hairballs. Look at this. They're rolling again, coming out of the water. That's a massive crocodile there. Let's see what he does. If he just sort of swallows the whole thing, swims off with it. Dinosaur of a crocodile. With these little ones coming in now from the side, trying to get what they can from this carcass before it is swallowed up entirely. Behemoths out here. Now, these crocodiles could quite easily... There we go. Look at it. I know this crocodile. He's the green crocodile that we've seen here before. Now, we've got these cameras all over the place, really. We've got them in four locations up and down this river. And in this particular crossing, just look at that. That is insane action from these crocodiles. I've never seen this before. I don't think there's much left of this poor wildebeest. Now, coming back to that dark green crocodile there at the back, this big guy, that guy that you're seeing over there. He's the one that dived on top of a zebra, a full-grown zebra. Here comes a hippo in to see what's going on. What's funny about it, hippo are attracted, in my opinion, to the frenzy of the crocodiles. But, did you know that hippo also ate meat? And it's well documented that hippo will eat meat and intestinal organs of animals. And they do that. Look at this. Hippo is going to bite this crocodile on the tail. Quite often we see these hippo coming in, sort of wanting to know what's going on. They get close to these crocodile and then give the crocodile a little bit of a nip to get out of the way. And another hippo also decided to come in. What's happening here? Yep, definitely looked like it took that big crocodile. And there it goes, hippo in, biting this crocodile. Could actually be feeding on this carcass, you know. So it's not uncommon for hippo to eat meat. In actual fact, it's not common for most herbivores to eat meat, apparently. Well, look at this, hippo fighting with a crocodile. Has it got something to eat there? Let's go and have a look. Nope. Not chewing on anything. 
what is happening here? You know, one of the most exciting things about these river cameras that we've put in is it's showing me, who's got almost 20 years experience in the bush, something new almost every single day. We're learning about these animals' behavior mainly because we're not having an impact on them. People are not part of these river cameras. And because of that, these animals are, are, are acting as if we weren't there, which we've gotten right with elephant and lion and hyena to a degree, but not with hippo and crocodile. You walk up to this river, and guaranteed they'll stop what they're doing. Yeah, this carcass is now washed slightly down river. You can have a look at these youngsters coming in as fast as what they can. There's a little bit of a morsel here. Let's see, this big green crocodile, does he come down the river with his little piece? I don't think this is him. I watched this big green guy about two weeks ago jump on top of a zebra, as I was saying. Crazy. Now, Heidi, you wanted to know if I've ever seen a crocodile make a kill on land uh, rather than in the water. Heidi, no. I haven't seen a crocodile make a kill on land. What I have seen a crocodile do is steal kills on land. Quite often in the Kruger National Park, close to where Juma is, I've watched crocodiles come out of the water to a kill that is relatively close to... Uh, the bank, walk up and sort of nonchalantly taking a carcass out of the jaws of a pride of lion and walking back into the river with it. Not much smaller than, than these crocodiles here. It's the biggest crocodiles I've ever seen in my life are these crocodiles that we're seeing in this river right here. I think it's because of the super abundance of meat that they have access to. Not all year round. Um, there are animals that live in the Mara Triangle, of course. Many, many animals that live here all through the year, but one and a half million wildebeest make a significant impact to these crocodiles' diets. And these wildebeest are compelled for some reason that we're still trying to fathom to cross and recross and cross again this river. And in the process, become prey for these massive crocodiles, but also drown. Uh, just the other day, we watched a mass drowning event, uh, the aftermath of which, and I counted about a thousand carcasses that came washing down the river. And that's what I think has happened here. I think that this carcass has come washing down the river from somewhere else. I've been at, this, at these cameras pretty much the whole day and I haven't seen any crossings. It must have come from somewhere else. Or it was killed before and stashed, hoarded underneath the water, which is also a fable of these, uh, of these uh, crocodiles. I'd, I've never seen crocodiles stash kills under the water. I mean, there's obviously folklore around about it, and I mean, people must have seen them stashing kills and eating old kills inside pans and whatnot. Whether they do that in a river as dynamic as this, I don't know. Time will tell. You've got a whole bunch of crocodiles now that have come, th come down swimming quite fast down river is obviously something that they're smelling. Look at this crocodile coming in here. Now, Timo, you wanted to know how long crocodile can last without eating. Timo, that is as a result of, look, there's, this is where the rest of this wildebeest is. Timo, um, that'll be as a result, quite a lot of this wildebeest has, that'll be as a result, excuse me, of the amount of food that they have and, uh, uh, or had last, and the ambient temperature. Crocodiles in a cool environment can, or cool or dry environment, can actually slow their meta metabolism down to virtually nothing. I've heard reports of crocodile being able to slow their metabolism down in a drought environment to three beats per minute, which is nothing, and last for two years without getting a bite to eat. I would imagine that that would be a very fat, healthy crocodile that would be able to last that long. I don't think small crocodile will be able to last that long without taking a bite to eat, to be honest with you, Timo. Um, I would imagine that they can last a couple of months at most, um, perhaps as long as a year, but it's very difficult to see a wild crocodile starving, mainly because wild crocodiles, a majority of their diet is made up of fish, fish that they catch uh, in the shallows, fish that they catch under the water, and fish that they lay in ambush for, and will come up and be swallowed whole almost instantaneously. It's so very difficult to say when a crocodile last had some meal, barring, of course, you being able to somehow see a crocodile in a state where you can monitor that. So I would imagine that a couple of months at most is what a crocodile could do without food. I don't think that they'd be able to last much more than that. 
but they may be able to get by on very meager pickings for up to two years. Let's have a look, that yellow bull stalk coming into the action again, obviously wanting desperately to, uh, to try and get some fish that are attracted to the morsels being stripped off of this carcass. There's this big green crocodile again. He's not, I don't know if he is the guy. He's a very dark green crocodile. Look at that. That is fantastic. Now Robin, you wanted to know what the ridges on the back of a crocodile are made of. They are um, basically a scale, and it's a, it's, a, it's a hard, horny scale. It's got no bone in the middle of it. It's made, mainly made up just of keratin, which is um, to a degree just like your hair, a clumped piece of hair. Um, what they are, other than decoration, um, I don't know, maybe to break up a some turbulence over the back of a crocodile enabling it to to you know live in water that's a little bit more or flowing a little bit stronger is unknown to me at the moment so i don't know what they are other than just the display for display purposes and potentially maybe some or other type of turbulence reducing adaptation let's see what this hippo does i'm watching these hippo take bites at these crocodiles It is nice, this. Although this hippo doesn't seem to be wanting to take a nibble at this crocodile. It looks like they've managed to drag this carcass upstream a little bit. There we go. Inside, let's see if he makes a big spin at it. I presume this is a he. It's a giant crocodile. That is just massive. Just have a look at that overdeveloped skull. Oh, there we go. Something underneath the water over there. He didn't like that. The bigger the skull, the bigger the prey that they can hold on to. And at a point, crocodile skulls get so big that they're actually incapable of feeding on much else except for these, uh, these wildebeest and zebra and topi that come down this time of the year. These wildebeest in the migration will spend months here leaving as soon as the rains return to the Serengeti Plains. Right, now, why don't we send you down back into the valley where it's not raining, it's raining where I am at the moment, where it's not raining, to go to Brent, who's heading into a forested area. Well, luckily for us, not a spot of rain down here. Now, it does look like we might be able, may, oh, bumpy road, manage, we might be able to avoid it. But indeed, I am heading into a slightly forested area. I'm um, where the Lugger. Now, a Lugger is a little creek uh, in Swahili where the Lugger comes out um, onto a lovely marsh area. So you often get big herds of, vo of uh, elephants and, and, and buffalo in this area. And of course, the Great Migration is still further to the south of us. So they're on their way. And some of you might notice I have donned what looks to be a tablecloth. It is not a tablecloth, it is my shuka. Now, a shuka is a Maasai blanket. It's traditionally worn um, by both men and women, but normally by men. And uh, it is very nice and cozy. Uh, it's got a little bit chillers here. Oh, Dear me. Now, here is one for the serious birders. There we go. A bit more. Sorry, Jean Andre. There we go. Now there is a lovely little bird, and it is one for the serious bird. It's all off it goes. Where are you going? Oh, there we go. Oh. That was one of the smallest birds we get out here. Unfortunately, it wasn't the best look at it, um, but that is what we are, call a pectoral patch cysticula. Yes, now an LBJ, for those who are new and wondering, what on earth is an LBJ? It is a, a very technical and scientific birding uh, sort of analogy. It means a little brown job. Now, often the best way to identify little brown jobs is from their calls. Um, so, yes, there we go, a little brown job, a pectoral patch, patch cysticula. Now, that should be another nice one for our regular viewers. Another little check on the bird list. Ah, uh -huh, 
birds, there we go. Well done, Lady Starfire, who's on 52 birds for her Mara list. Oh, we're getting there. We're going to have to get you up to 100. Lickety split. Now, if we do have any new viewers out there, we do encourage you to get involved. And uh, a lot of our regular viewers have uh, bird lists, tree lists, mammal lists. So it is quite fun. I keep a list of everything I see, and uh, it is lots and lots of fun. Now, speaking of keeping lists, now I haven't quite managed to tick this one off my list yet, but to go see the largest ever cheetah coalition in the history of, that we know of cheetah coalitions. So let's jump back across to Scotty. on the other side so uh, you could see me looking knowingly into the into the distance uh, now we are heading down towards quite a, a well quite a favorite of mine in this 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 northern part of the triangle we're heading down towards the Samaki swamp which is where this lugger flows into eventually and uh, I'm still convinced I am going to find a leopard in that area and that far tree line over there, which is where we're going. But I'm taking a lovely little afternoon bumble, little afternoon game drive while we're on our way down there. Uh, see what we can see. Now, you never know what's around the corner. I've often found some of those big male lions in this area. So that would be a treat. And of course, the Angama pride hunt in this area quite frequently as well. But, alas, no lions, just a wart pig with some elephants in the distance. There we go, some wart pigs. So two grey tusked animals on either side of the sort of size spectrum visible from up here. Yeah, there's a big herd of elephants in the distance there. Uh, we are going to make our way down towards them. I, do, I feel like I haven't had some good elephant time for a while. And it is always wonderful to spend some time immersed in a herd of ellies. Now here's the lugger I was talking about. So during the rainy season, or if it rains a lot, all the water that comes off the escarpment will actually flow down through here and into that big Samaki swamp. And uh, you can't even get a car through here. It's so deep. So, fortunately, it's, it is the dry season, so we are across it with uh, almost no fanfare. Oh, but quickly across the step with something incredible. You know, we're watching this young hippo send off this crocodile that has got some of this wildebeest carcass with it. And I've watched this hippo mouth this crocodile easily three or four times in the last 10 minutes or so. It's not a very old hippo, this. I think more mischievous than anything else. I've also watched this hippo pick up the, the wildebeest carcass. We're busy watching crocodiles devour a wildebeest carcass that came flowing down the river, and all of a sudden, his hippo decided to get involved. A hippo, very gregarious. There's another, there's another hippo there seeing off the crocodiles. It's not uncommon for hippo to actually eat meat. And I wonder what if this crocodile is actually feeding, I mean, this hippo is actually feeding on the leftover wildebeest carcass. Let's just see. Excuse the odd jump to the picture. It is absolutely pouring where I am at the moment. And what that does is it creates a little bit of signal interference between when I'm sitting and where these crossings are, which are a couple of miles away from where I am at the moment. Sometimes the signal stops through the rain. So excuse the odd jump or two. It's just part of being able to bring you a live wildlife spectacle like we're doing at the moment. This is, of course, coming to you live from the Mara River in southern Kenya. These hippo have just decided that that's enough. They either, I don't know what they're doing. It doesn't look like they're carrying that carcass with them. That was the last place I saw the carcass, at least, anyway. Let's go back and see what's happening to these crocodiles. Now, Matt Tundi, you wanted to know if these crocodiles are territorial 
or these hippos territorial with the crocs in the water while they are feeding. Um, to be honest with you, I think that these crocodiles and hippos actually know one another. Hippo will, will, female hippo will, will belong to harems that are controlled by males. These males are dominant over these harems in, in portions of the river where hippo can spend the day and will be there for decades. I mean, a hippo lives for 40 years on. Crocodiles, big crocodiles, will live and dominate a certain portion of, of, a, of, a, of a river, usually the pools where fish are most abundant or where, in this particular case, crocodile, uh, of, uh, wildebeest carcasses would wash up or where wildebeest cross. And crocodiles live for 80 years, who knows, 100 years in this particular environment. And so my opinion, big crocodiles and old hippo know one another. And therefore, why not? young hippos and young crocodiles, or at least crocodiles that are at an age where they can start to compete for meat in these ponds. And so while I do think that each species is territorial, while I know for a fact that each species is territorial, um, I also think that there's this dynamic between crocodiles and hippos, similar to how hyena and leopard or hyena and lion have with one another. One would assume that they're exclusive for one another because they feed on different things and just because they share the same pond that they had nothing that they'd have nothing to do with each other but i've watched too much to the contrary over the last couple of weeks to believe that i definitely think that crocodile and hippo have a relationship i don't know what that is in months and years to come i hope to explore and discuss this with all of you watch this with us and we'll and who will so frequently be watching these, behave, these behavioral traits as well. Pause, you wanted to know how do baby crocodiles survive to become adults? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, luck is about all that I can say. Luck and cunning. Because baby crocodiles are very tasty morsels for a lot of different things. Now, could I ask that Rebecca just push us through to the mountain camera? I just want to show you what I mean by the rain. Have a look at how it is absolutely pouring here where we are. Now out there on the plain, it's not raining whatsoever. In actual fact, the rain stops at the edge of that rock that you can see over there. And it's just raining on this mountain top, so desperately needed. Isn't that just incredible? Now, what we are seeing over here, just hold on, we've got at Main North Crossing, we have got some zebras who might be interested in crossing. Now, this is what these cameras are here for, folks. Crossings. These are our crossing cameras. These zebras look like they've actually crossed already. Let us go around a little bit and see what's going on. It's not common for animals to cross and then recross and cross again. Let's see if we haven't got zebra crossing here. Got a bunch of cars massing. That is usually an, a very good sign that we are about to see a crossing. You can see all those cars on the other side. That is very promising for here. So that means that I'll keep my eye on these crossings for you. Hopefully the rain doesn't play too much havoc with, uh, with what we've got. And we can see these, these behemoths of the, of the river. No, those, those zebra already look like they've crossed. All right. What we're going to do is send you over to Brent, who's got some elephant to show you, and I'm going to keep my eye on these crossings for you. Oh, look at this. We're right next to an absolutely gorgeous old female elephant and she is completely relaxed in our presence. She's actually almost looks like she's about to fall asleep. Hey, old girl. Isn't she absolutely stunning? She's probably 15 feet from us. And she's just waiting for the rest of the herd to catch up. She's not really feeding. Now, 
when you're very close to elephants, it's very important to read their body language. Now, the most important thing for me is always to watch their tail. You can see her tail is sitting nice and loose and swishing around, uh, and that means she's not upset at all. And she's very, very relaxed, and uh, she's quite calm. Now, the rest of the herd is coming. Now she's heard something. Now, even though she's lifted her head, which is quite often uh, people think is a sign of aggression to elephants, sometimes it's not. Um, I think she actually heard something. There's another herd of elephants around, and she heard them, and she's lifted her head. She was also smelling something in the in the grass, and something's upset her. Now, there's just been some. Oh, it's this other herd of elephants that's passing behind us. Don't worry, we can't swing around to them. But she doesn't seem to like those elephants very much. Do you, girl? You probably find that she's got the whiff of a, a male, uh, a young male who might be in must or being full of nonsense. But here come the rest of the herd. And there's some tiny little babies. Look at all three of them together. Isn't that wonderful? Hello, little guys. Oh. oh, the wind's just picked up. I hope that storm that was with Steph hasn't come here. And uh, in case some of you are wondering whether those are triplets, no, they're not. They'll be from uh, different individuals in the herd, but they're just all working together. Now I'm just keeping an eye behind me to make sure that massive storm that was with Steph hasn't come sneak up on us. Now there's actually one, two, three, four, five, six little ones in this herd. So this is a very fertile herd of elephants, hey, aren't you guys? Now they're moving out from the Tsumaki Swamp, and I said it attracts quite a lot of elephants during the day, um, moving up towards the forested areas and up towards the escarpment in the evening. Shravi is wondering how old is the matriarch? Now that one we started off watching I don't think was the matriarch. Um, just looking I'd probably say this female closest to us now um, is the oldest and probably the matriarch. And with female elephants it can be quite difficult to discern their age uh, in, in between. But I'd say she's over 40 for sure, probably closer to 50. I'm just going to keep quiet. Listen to the sound of them moving through the grass. That is so cool. Hello, Davin. Davin is wondering whereabouts is this taking place? Well, Davin, this is live from the Maasai Mara in Kenya, and uh, we really welcome you on uh, to the back of the world's largest game drive vehicle, Davin, and encourage you to send a few more questions. While the Ellie's are about to sneak on past us, I think we're going to move on, and there's some more Ellie's up ahead that aren't about to disappear. Well, let's leave them ahead up there, and let's go see what these up to. It looked like there was a young bull there. While we're watching those elephants, we have these two hardy our ibis. Suddenly got a fright and explode out of the lugger. And I was hoping there might be a serval or a leopard sneaking around in there. And it doesn't look like it. There go the hardy dars. There's those ibis making those horrible noises. Bye, hardy dars. So, here we go. There's the next herd of elephants. Oh, a gust of wind caught our canvas. So I'm just going to keep chatting while I fix it quickly. So you can see the much greener area behind them. There's some zebras out there as well. Um, 
from where the water from the lugger actually comes down into this area and I've actually seen a good couple of hundred elephants at one time on these swampy areas um, but not this evening so I just need to fix the canvas quickly um, just do this so I apologize about any funny noises oh, I'm just trying to fix that it's blowing away with the wind that is coming from that storm I'm just climbing up the car. Let's get this all tucked in neatly and tidy. There we go. Easy peasy. Now, oh, quickly, quickly, quickly. Uh, what heron is that? No, little black crown night heron. It's disappearing, it's disappearing. That's a good one for the birders. I'll see if I can get back. Oh, he's gone. Oh, fiddlesticks. Where's my ears? But um, we do have a grey-backed fiscal for the birders dead ahead, sitting on the little pop there. He has... There we go. Hello, grey-backed fiscal. So this morning we saw the normal fiscal shrike. Now this evening we've got the grey-backed fiscal. Slightly larger. Uh, still known for hanging its poor insect victims. Um, upon spiked branches or thorns. Now of course that's not to be cruel. It's uh, to keep for later. It's a snack tree full of bugs. Okay, well, let's keep moving along here. I've had often had very good luck with lions in this area, particularly those four big males. Bobby is wondering, is there an age where female elephants stop falling pregnant? Uh, there is indeed, Bobby, and, and, and like with most animals, it can vary from individual. But uh, definitely once they start being over um, sort of oh, 55 to 60, um, it, is, it, is, it is all done skis, I'm afraid. Um, but they will still play a very active part in the social structure of an elephant herd. Um, but they are no means, but they are no longer reproducing. is wondering, do elephants migrate to the Mara? Ooh, there we go. There's a kukul. Um, yeah, we go. You got him, jean -Dre. There we go. White-browed kukul. For the bird is there. Now, Declan, sorry about that. I got distracted by the bird. Um, they they have seasonal migra migrations around the Mara, um, but they are resident. They don't move to and from the Mara. So there we go. White-browed kukul. Another nice one for the bird list. Now, one of the ones I'm very excited to show you is a black kukul. We haven't had any luck with them. I've seen them a couple of times, um, but we haven't managed to get them live on air yet. Sorry, I'm just having a quick scan with my binos. Well, it seems like the crossing cameras are being absolutely fantastic. Let's go see what Steph's got next. His crossing cameras are being fantastic, although not as fantastic as Brent's birding ability, I must be honest. He, uh, he definitely has that trumped on me. Now, these crocodiles have drifted a little bit downstream of where they last were. I think that there's still some of this carcass left under the water. And I think one of these crocodiles is holding it. Here comes this hippo wading in. This hippo, this youngster, has come in every now and again. Show, opens up a mouth, which is a threat display for a hippo. Smacks its lips in the water, just warning these crocodiles, I'm coming. It's another threat display that hippos do. These two youngsters, obviously bored with resting for the day. There we go, wide open mouth. Now... Hippos have evolved those massive gapes and those massively elongated teeth simply to threaten one another and to exert dominance over one another as well. Now in this particular instance, these youngsters, without anything else to do, are giving these massive crocodiles a go for their money. I think one of these crocodiles is holding on to the remnants of this wildebeest. Not as many as they were, also not that frenzy that you saw, so by now I think most of this wildebeest is finished. 
with the exception that in one or two of these crocodiles, I think they're holding on to a tasty morsel. In these particular, in these two. And see what they do? They tend to have these gaps where they don't do anything. And then all of a sudden, they raise themselves out of the water and you're looking at half a wildebeest again. I see Brent was putting on his rain cover. Looks like this rain is on the way to where we are. This river is definitely a little bit fuller than it was yesterday, which is good. When I first came here in January, you could literally walk across this uh, particular place. Uh, sorry, Rebecca, would you perhaps uh, just reply the question again? Ah. Now, Wilson, you wanted to know if the rivers smell bad with all the dead animals and the crocodiles in it. No, I wouldn't say that it smells bad. It doesn't smell like, it doesn't smell any different to any other river. In actual fact, because it's flowing, it doesn't smell bad at all. What does smell bad is when these rivers stop flowing and these pools where these hippo live get congested with both crocodile and hippo. And what happens is their dung and then urine starts to increase the concentrations of uh, all these phosphates inside this, uh, in the, inside the, the the water that's left, and these ponds can start to stink something terrible. In this particular instance, because it's flowing, it's washing its nutrients down, and all these accumulated waste products down, and so it doesn't smell. It smells like a river, basically. Now I've got some updates for you on why those two zebra were there. If we go to Maine South. There is an accumulation of wildebeest. These wildebeest are part of the migration. They have come into this area from the Serengeti Plains. And they cross and recross this Mara River. We are still trying to fathom why. It has to do with food. It potentially is predator pressure, although most of the crossings we're seeing are midday to, to, to late afternoon, which is not really when lions are most active. And they tend to come, they mass on the side of these banks, and then they cross, usually precipitated by the actions of just one that decides to weather. Normally that one makes it to the other side, whereas all the others that follow become targets for crocodiles, lions, just the general flow of the river. These ones look like they're lying down. They don't look like they're gonna cross anytime soon. But you never know where these guys are, I must be honest. Uh, Tony, you wanted to know, do, river, do elephants make river crossings? Um, and when do they do this? Tony, they absolutely make river crossings. Um, quite often, other animals will use the pathways that elephant have, uh, have um, basically carved out of the banks over the centuries. And that'll become a crossing point. Elephants are incredibly clever. They choose their crossing points, obviously for them, where their babies won't get washed away, where there's a lot of sand on the bank, potentially where there's some rocks for some footing. I think that they migrate up and down uh, these banks, you know, depending on the species. But rest assured, Tony, that most of the crossings that you see will be used from elephant, or will be used by elephant, were probably made by elephant over the centuries. Elephant make pathways up rivers, up valleys. That's fantastic. There are these white-throated gnus with the Olulolo escarpment in the distance. I am on top of that escarpment that you're looking at in the distance. Can't quite make up the hill that I'm on through the haze, but we are about five miles or so as the crow flies from these crossings at the moment. Doesn't look like these wildebeest are going to cross anytime soon, does it? They're just standing by. Perhaps they'll cross later on. Perhaps they'll cross tomorrow. Perhaps they'll turn around and walk back where they came from. Anything is possible with these guys. Amazing. Eh? Now, Shannon, you obviously a new viewer asking how often does, uh, does this go, go live and it is amazing. I must agree with you, Shannon, it is amazing. I, I mean, I've been doing this for some years now and I must be honest with you, it is, still amazes me that we can bring you live as it's happening anywhere on, on earth. 
But to answer your question directly, Shannon, we go live every single day. We go live uh, from our camps in Juma in the Kruger National Park. Um, right now, I think it is at 6 o'clock Central Africa time to 9 o'clock and in the afternoons from about 3.30 to about 6.30 in the afternoons, you can go on. That we'll try, and, or we do try and add in footage from the morrow from time to time. And of course we do Facebook notif well, we go live on Facebook whenever there's a crossing throughout the day. All right, what we're gonna do is send you over to Scott who's sitting with those cheetah he's got. Well, we were also hoping and doing some Facebook Lives today. However, these five cheetah have been fast asleep the whole day and therefore not justified a Facebook Live. For those of you who have just joined on the safari, my name is Scott. It's a great pleasure to have you on board with myself and Dave, who's on camera. A uh, warm welcome to all the Natura Wild YouTube viewers. It's very good to know that a whole bunch more people are getting to enjoy the Safari Live experience. And like I said, there are five male cheetah all piled up together here. There's quite a strong wind blowing and it's quite cool. For those of you who were with me early, you'll notice that I've popped on my jersey. And hopefully this cool weather gets these guys up and active a little bit earlier than expected. However, we've learned some quite interesting insight into these five male cheetah and kind of debunked a bit of a myth about cheetah and that is that they don't move much after dark. That's quite a widespread belief and the theories are that they tend to only move after dark if there's good moonlight. However, about a week ago we followed them from sunset until 11 o'clock at night in pitch blackness. There was not a sliver of the moon in the sky for the whole time that we were on the move with them. And interestingly, they decided to fall asleep about 300 meters away from some lions that were roaring. So we are looking forward to spending a lot more time out with them at night and maybe finding out whether they are successful hunters after dark. Hello to Morgan. You would like to know how fast these cheetahs are. Well, they'll all be slightly different, just like us as humans. Some people are faster than others but they are the fastest mammal on earth and their speeds are in excess of 60 miles an hour and there are varying kind of reports regarding their top speeds but roughly around 100 to 120 kilometers an hour are the realistic speeds that these animals will achieve they are far more slender and slight than lion and leopard built for speed and less for confrontation, less wrestling of their prey. Their prey is often quite tired by the time they latch onto it, so their job of suffocating and bringing down their prey is technically a li little bit easier than that of lion and leopard. However, these boys are mastering the arts of hunting a fully grown wildebeest, which is a very formidable sized prey for an animal as slight as the cheetah and it could kind of be equated to lions hunting buffalo one of the ultimate showdowns that you can see on the African plains well some other animals that we may see these cheetah hunting in the coming weeks are topi and zebra and Brent has got some of those waiting for you there we go we've made it all the way down to what is the Samaki Swamp, or what's left of it, most of it is dry, but you can see the green grass is attracting zebra, topi, waterbuck, as well as elephant and a warthog. Now, not all the zebra, and uh, oh, oh, look at that, we've got chasing a male, chasing a female waterbuck there. Oh, into the, oh, now, he, he, she got away from you, old chum, you weren't quick enough. There we go, a male defasa waterbuck. And now you can see the green of the swamp in comparison to the surrounding grasslands. And there's some eddies as well. Oh, well, 
hello, uh, Debbie. Uh, Debbie is wondering why I refer to our vehicles as the world's largest safari. Well, now, Debbie, I was a safari guide for many, many years, and I think the most people I ever took on the back of my vehicle was six. And I, I don't even know. And there's thousands of you out there enjoying the safari live. So it is, in theory, the world's biggest safari vehicle. Uh, not in terms of actuality, but in... Oh, there we go. We've got some... Oh, he's chasing a little boy now. Get... Whoa, get going, little man. Now, when you see a male waterback behaving like that, there normally is a female in Eastress somewhere about that is causing him to see off any would-be competition to his lovely lady friend. Now, very interesting, those elephants have either heard or seen something. They've just suddenly stopped, almost like um, they're playing that game. I've forgotten what it is, but you have to keep dead still. You just freeze. And their ears went out and they were listening. Now, of course, elephants communicate in lots of low rumbles that we can barely hear. Ah, well, all is fine. Let's just continue on, says um, and the matriarch. Because there's that bottom fe that female right at the back there. See, she's quite a big, bit bigger, bit older than the others. Listening very intently to something in the distance. And I've been trying to run away from that storm that was pelting Steph. And I can hear a few pitter-patter of raindrops on the roof of my uh, vehicle, so I'm going to keep moving a little bit. Now, there are some buffalo um, and some more elephant and some more general game. Now, when we refer to general game, it's like zebra, uh, giraffe, topi, waterbuck. So while I dash away from the storm, oh, you can see it coming towards me now. I've been trying my best to avoid it driving in circles. There, that's that wall of water coming towards us. Um, we're going to send you back across to Scott, who's sitting high and dry with some spotted cats. Well, let's hope it remains high and dry where we are. We're quite far away from Brent. I'm guessing about 25 kilometers as the crow flies and we are to the east of him quite far away from the Olololo escarpment which is way off to our right we're looking south at the moment and I think the Olololo escarpment creates quite a lot of oreographic weather oreographic is basically when oreos come together and cause rainfall <laughs> I'm, I'm, only, I'm only joking. It's just basically rainfall that's induced by mountains and it does create a nice lush belt of vegetation along that escarpment and especially in and around our wonderful camp which is perched on top of it. It would be terrible if we did get caught in the rain here because we are a long way from home. So as you can see the boys are still all cuddled up with evidently no immediate intentions of getting up on the move. So we are just going to remain patient. We've already invested about, I'd say, five and a half to six hours sitting with these guys today since we found them. And we intend to stay with them as long as feasibly possible. Sean, you ask an interesting question that I was thinking about myself earlier, um, and that is, don't these guys need to keep more of an eye out because they are not the apex predators in the area, meaning that they are under threat from other predators like lion, like leopard, hyena, even other cheetah. I mean, a coalition of five like this will feel quite comfortable around five, uh, other cheetah because they are unlikely to come across a larger group than the, the group the size they are themselves but they're in a very large open clearing here so I guess that coupled with the fact that their senses are really good their hearing they're not too concerned and every now and then one does pick their head up the question is how do they synchronize picking their head up it's one of the problems that uh, the presenters and the cameramen are, for Safari Live are currently facing when we're spending our full nights out we 
tend to all get sleepy at the same time, which doesn't work out well. In the start of the shift, everyone's like, you can never sleep. It's like, well, I'm not tired yet. And then you both end up getting tired, usually between about 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock. Those are the toughest hours. And if we both fall asleep, then how, how is one of us going to know when to open an eye to see if the cheetah or lion or whatever animals you are sticking with are still there? Um, thankfully, we... All right, we have got wildebeest massing on the banks. Just look how many animals are here. Thousands upon thousands of wildebeest now on the bank of the Mara River here in the Masa Mara in Kenya. Now, it is a little bit juddery and stuttery, and that is because we've got rain all around us, just playing havoc with our signal. Of course, water and electronics don't mix very well. But just have a look at how many wildebeest are here. And those giant crocodiles just lying in the sun basking themselves. Not able to move, too cold to move, and just look at all this meat. I want you to have a look at this. I'm going to go wide a little bit. They might just be coming down to drink, but just have a look on the horizon. Now all it takes is one. We saw it yesterday, a similar amount of wildebeest, thousands. All it took was one brave soul to jump into the water and the next thing we just had wildebeest swimming up and down, backwards and forwards. It may happen the same now. Who knows what's actually going to happen. They definitely look like they want to cross. They don't look like they're all coming down to drink. Yeah, the zebra are going inside. They want to grass. Epo scaring them off. Wildebeest standing by, looking to see if these zebra are brave enough to cross. This is a crossing point for the zebra. They look like they want to go. One walks in. Are you going to go? There's a crocodile in front of that zebra. That is not a floating log. That is a crocodile. Scared off that zebra. Zebra saw it coming. Hippo in the background opening up its mouth. More just coming down to drink there. Let's just keep our options open here by just keeping on checking what's happening across the front here. This is amazing. All right. What we're going to do is Scott's cheetah are up and about, and so while we're going to have a look at those very rare and special animals, I'll keep an eye on these wildebeest and call you back if anything happens. Well, isn't it funny how the prospects can just change in a minute like that? The wildebeest arrive down at a crossing point, and these cheetah decide to get up and start thinking about what they are going to get up to this evening. Now, as exciting as this is, I must forewarn you that there is a chance that this is kind of just a preliminary wake-up, kind of like moving from your bedroom to the lounge and flicking on the news. Cats are off teeth, but if they did, that's something that they would do in this time. And then... He's just being hauled away from Scott like that. We've got rain all over the Mara Triangle at the moment. As you know, it is difficult to bring you... A live show like we bring in. This is happening right now as we speak from the, from the banks of the Mara River and the Mara Triangle where we are at the moment and the Masai Mara Game Reserve where Scott is with those cheetah. Not too far away from where we are now. Just have a look at this. They don't seem like they're wanting to cross. The zebra went in. They got scared off by a crocodile. Coming in a little bit too eager. Here we've got some wildebeest wanting to get into the water. Don't look like they're drinking. All the hallmarks are here for a crossing, everyone. Don't go anywhere. Now, yesterday we saw a bunch of wildebeest cross here, thousands, tens of thousands even. What we didn't see was any crocodile action, and that was because it was very cold. Now, will the same be true of today? A little bit earlier, we've been watching just further upstream from here, not even two or three miles from where these wildebeest are. Many, many, many crocodiles dismembering one single wildebeest carcass. Look how many wildebeest are here. Will it be the same at this crossing? Will we have crocodiles capable of moving, capable of attacking? Is the river even stronger today than it was yesterday? Now, Lisa, you've asked an interesting question. For how long will these 
uh, will these wildebeest migrate? The answer to that question is forever, um, Lisa. And the reason for that is that a migration neither has a beginning nor an end. Wildebeest are born on the southern plains of the Serengeti all the way in Tanzania. And when the rains stop, the grass stops growing and dies because it's quite short grass there and the sun is harsh here on the equator, burns all their food away. The wildebeest then follow the rains north and into Kenya, into the Mara, Masai Mara, which has this river, the Mara River, and it has a different type of vegetation, which is a little bit more robust in terms of being able to survive a dry period. A long dry period is from April until November here in this particular area. The wildebeest come here because the grass is good, but as soon as the rains start again, the wildebeest will then go back to the sweet grass plains of the Serengeti and will then begin the, well, begin, end, start, finish, whichever one you want to have a look at it, but it is a cycle, it is a circle. So right now these wildebeest have just arrived in this area. You're looking at about one and a half million of these wildebeest and about 250,000 zebra that make the journey all the way from Tanzania to Kenya. Now, Rocky Knight, you wanted to know if the rhino has ever crossed the river. Um, good question there, Rocky Knight. White rhino battle to swim, similar, um, they do battle to swim. So white rhino are poor swimmers. Black rhino, however, are not poor swimmers. Have I ever seen a black rhino swim a river? No, I've never seen a black rhino swim a river. Um, have I ever heard of a black rhino swimming a river? No, but that is because black rhino are incredibly rare. Uh, we are lucky enough he here to have lots of black rhino, and I'm sure that over the next couple of years we may even film a black rhino crossing this river. Who knows? Um, will they cross? It is feasible. Black rhino can swim. Will they do it now? Will they do it when the river is high or low? I'm not too sure. Now, those wildebeest at the back are moving away. You can see that there is a movement of wildebeest, the general movement of all these animals is away from this river. And that happens so frequently. They come down, looks like they're going to cross. All of a sudden they decide, no, not today. River's looking a bit cold, looking a bit fast, looking a bit brown, looking a bit green, whatever the reason is. They decide, not today. And then you get the odd occasion where one makes the leap and it just absolutely pours wildebeest into this river. They're not drinking, they're just standing on the banks looking. Uh, Frank, you wanted to know if there's fish in this river? There absolutely are fish in this river, Frank. Um, probably uh, the majority of the fish over here would be tilapia and tilapia species. Most of, and then I heard of a cowfish. Uh, the questions were, are there tiger fish in this river? I don't actually know what other fish species are in this river. Brent Leo Smith, as the prime fisherman amongst my colleagues and friends, is probably best suited to answer that question and may be able to shed some light on exactly what different fish species are you most likely to occur here. But most commonly are catfish and the tilapia species or bream. Oh, there's still a lot of wildebeest here, all just standing. There's not much going on. Some still arriving from the back there. Those wildebeest still pouring in. We might yet see a crossing here from these wildebeest. Difficult to say. Awesome. All right, we're going to keep our eye on what these wildebeest are doing. You're off to Brent Leo Smith and some carnivores. Yes, well, we've got, there we go. We didn't get the best view of the banded mongoose early on today. I just do absolutely adore them. And there we go, making lots of noise. Now, the one, um, well, one that we had while I was growing up, his name was Lord Montague, the mongoose. Now, you can see they are very, very busy foragers. Now, Steph said we were with a couple of carnivores, and that is the smaller carnivore species. We also managed to spot some very lazy leons. There we go, it looks like there's a third lioness. There we go, is up. There we go, there she is, walking. And, um, 
here she goes. And I hadn't seen her yet, I only saw the two lazy ones lying closest to us. Now I wonder if there's any males about. She doesn't look too hungry. Anyway, let's get a bit closer to her. Now, I might have to dash at uh, the last second. I'm keeping a very close eye out on the rain. So, Steph's sitting up there, and he's completely covered in rain, and I'm just hoping that I've sort of been skirting, skirting around the edges or edges and hoping to avoid it. And thank you, for Steph, for sending the question our way. Frank would like to know, what fish species might you get in the Mara River? Now, I am a, a lover of all things fishy and fishing. Now, the most dominant species in the Mara River uh, will uh, be uh, the sharp-toothed catfish, Clarinus shabby. You know there's a lion over there. Don't worry, you're too big and you're in must. Now, he's in must. So, a heightened hormonal state. And they can be a little bit naughty when they're in must. Can't you, mister? Are you going to get cheeky? You don't want to get cheeky with me. I'll sort you out. Yes, I will. Hello, big boy. What you want? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Don't be silly. I'll give you a hiding. Don't misbehave. Now, it's very important, as I say, in reading elephant body language. So if I were to move the car now, it would actually cause him to chase us. So that's why I'm keeping still. Um, I'm, I've had a few words with him. I haven't got upset with him yet. I haven't had to use my stern voice that I use on certain elephants when they misbehave. So he's just being a little bit curious. He's not stopped to start eating. So I'm gonna start the car now. And I said, let it run for a few seconds. You always do that. Um, animal gets used to the noise. To you too, mister. Hey, no more problems, are we good? Yes, we are. Good boy. He listens, that one. Uh, making sure he still listens. He does. We are unfortunately going to have to change our plans, I fear. Um, we can give you another last look at that lioness, but I'm going to have to turn around and make a run. Um, I thought I was going to be able to avoid all the rain, but unfortunately I haven't. But there she is. Uh, oh, maybe we can last a little bit longer. Where are you off to, madam? Oh, dearie, dearie me. Okay, um, I'm gonna have to turn around. And I'm gonna have to do some running from the rain. Otherwise, Jandre and I might get shocked. Uh, but while we do that, uh, we're going to run across to the dry side of the river today, uh, back to Scott with those beautiful boys. Well, it seems like our luck is increasing. <clears throat> Excuse me, these boys are up in the move and in the direction that we can quite easily follow them. I was concerned that they were going to cross a riverbed, which would have made our lives a little bit tricky. So that's the good news. I'm about to get you guys into a great spot to have them walking straight down the barrel towards us. Almost there. Here we go. Perfect. And it seems like Brent is still running from the rain. Let's hope his luck continues because it will not be fun if he gets caught out. We've done quite a few modifications to the vehicle, so our rain protection is somewhat sieve-like, which is a bit of a concern when it's raining. But happy to hear that he did at least get you a glimpse of some lions. 
and it's turning out to be a wonderful sunset safari. You can see the green belt of vegetation. That is the riverbed that I was concerned that they were going to cross. Hello, Paul. You would like to know if cheetah like to wait by the water's edge in order to ambush their prey, similar to what lions do. And um, not uh, hugely that I know of. And to be honest, even lions a lot of the time will simply have just finished drinking at a water hole and then have decided to sleep there more than actually knowing that they're going to get easy meals there. That's my opinion, of course. I'm a believer that the predators get given too much credit for their planning and strategizing. I believe it's more kind of luck of the draw. But yes, they could well end up being close to a water point when prey come down and ambush them. But something that's always surprised me about predators, including lions, is that if they were all to sleep just 50 meters apart, as opposed to in a big clump, and that's especially the case with lion, who don't have to worry about safety as much as cheetah do, immediately they would be sleeping in a kind of hunting formation. So if anything did stumble upon them, they'd all be spread out. But they never do that, which is testament to my theory that they are not as sprite as everyone makes them out to be. They're just very fast with sharp claws and a lust for meat, and that's what causes them to latch on to prey from time to time. Isn't this scene an absolutely beautiful one? Golden afternoon sunlight, five male cheetahs all in their prime. Cordelia, you would like to know if cheetah have got any risk of being consumed by other big cats? Yes, they certainly do. They will be killed by leopard as well as lion. It's a bit more of a task for a leopard to take down a lion, uh, sorry, a, a, a cheetah, and it'll mainly be the male leopard that kill cheetah, not likely female leopards. And what they have been known to do is actually hoist cheetah up into a tree, having stolen the cheetah's kill, killed the cheetah and put both of them up a tree. Not a pretty image. And certainly lion, if they get a hold of cheetah, will make short work of them. So let's hope that is something we never bear witness to, but it is certainly a reality out here. Marvellous. Now, before they head too far off into the distance, I think it would be a good opportunity for us to reposition and try and get some shots of them walking straight into the sun. They are heading west at the moment, slightly north, west, and who knows, maybe they will end up crossing this riverbed. We're going to have to cross it either way to get home. We've got a long, long drive to get home this evening. But that doesn't matter, because Dave and I are committed to these boys and we're going to stay as long as possible, which is probably going to be about another half an hour before we need to rush off. Hello, Roshni. You'd like to know what are the distinguishing features that can be used to distinguish between different cheetah? And it's their spot patterns, um, they are all different, just like the leopard. And basically, you can look at any portion of a cheetah's body and get a map of its spots, and then use that for your ID kit. And it's the same with leopard, you could choose a random spot on their bottom, and those patch of spots will be unique to that cheetah or leopard. What is more likely to do is to look on the face and you see the spots that run down from the corner of their eyes at about a kind of like a 45 degree angle down away from their eye down their cheek. We'll look at that one now. It's got distinctive spots there. And then if we look at another one, you'll notice clearly that the spots are quite different on each of the animal's faces. It's difficult now while they're moving, but those two next to one another Clearly different. The one at the back had far bigger spots with bigger spaces between them, whereas that one in the front had smaller spots more dotted closely together. So, I mean, you, you, there's no set way, but that is one of the ways of going about it. There's quite a few other vehicles enjoying the sighting with us, which is wonderful. 
because if people don't come out here and spend money on being on safari, these places will not be looked after. So do not be alarmed by the people. Their presence is ensuring that this place gets looked after. And unlike us, who are very, very fortunate, these vehicles cannot off-road. One or two of them may take chances, as I probably would, but they will not um, go to the same level as we do. And that is one of the benefits of being on the Safari Live team. We've got special permission to go and do things that most other people cannot. Oh, well, there's this, not a surprise visitor joining, but James Henry has joined the fray in one way or another. So go off and see what he's up to. I, I was going to try and take off Steph's accent because he's sitting right next to me doing his, uh, his management work. And then I thought, no, his left bicep and left fist are probably slightly too large for me to be tangling with while I'm trying to narrate a crossing. Anyway, oops, just getting control of the cameras. Yes, it is I. James Henry speaking, not um, uh, not Steph anymore, and oh, we are getting some horrible break up there. Sorry about that. Uh, I must just tell you, this is precisely what happened yesterday. These wildebeest came herring down. There they all are, and they eventually crossed at this point over here. But they're not there at the moment, and much like yesterday, of course we have got, well, roughly 4,500 punters looking on to see if the crossing is going to take place. And as Scott was saying, of course, they are such a crucial part of African ecotourism and conservation. And very nice to see, I tell you, although there are a lot of them, they're keeping well, well away and not disturbing the behaviour of these animals in any way. So that's good to see. Nice practice going on there. Good. So that is the state of play here. I have seen in my vast experience of crossings, which uh, consists of two weeks last year and roughly two weeks this year, uh, I have seen them come to this crossing point and do precisely this every single time. They come rushing along here, two or three go down, everyone in the final control jumps on the controls, everyone fights over the control in here, the joystick, everyone prepares to go live, batteries are charged, people are shout at each other, they're screaming, wailing, gnashing of teeth, and four of them lie down precisely where they are now, and that is the end of that. So with any luck, what will happen is that they will eventually decide that it is a good idea to cross. But the darker it gets, the smaller the chances of them crossing are. It is unlikely that they will cross in the darkness, but it is likely that they will cross still today, I think. Ah! Now, Harris, you ask a very good question here, and um, you say, can we say that this migration of animals is one of the world, or is the world's biggest? Well, Harris, it just so happens that we did, a, we played a game that we play, uh, one lie, and in that first two truths and dun, 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 one lie, we have gave three facts, one of that the wildebeest migration is the largest migration of mammals in the world. Well, we started off sort of playing with that. And that was not true. And um, that in the end, that wasn't the one we gave. But it isn't true. It's the largest hoofed mammal migration in the world. So it's the greatest number of hoofed mammals that move. 1.5 million of them, and if 2 million if you include all the zebra and the Thompson's gazelles. The biggest mammal migration in the world, or the largest number of animal animals migrating is a bat migration, I believe, that happens between Texas and somewhere else. I'm not sure exactly where. But that is the largest number of migrating mammals. The furthest uh, migration, this is actually not a tremendously distant migration. The total distance they cover is probably not a hugely much more than 250 miles or so, and sometimes less depending on how direct the routes they take are, and sometimes probably up to 300 if they, well, go hither and yon a bit more than they would normally. So that, that, it's not that long, much longer, of course, 
is the humpbacked whale. The humpbacked whale is the longest mammalian migration in the world. I can never remember the, the exact um, sort of distance, but I think it's 2,800 miles. I can check that up. 2,800 miles one way. So I think they do that each way every single year. So that's obviously more than 10, well, it's actually more than 20 times the distance that this bunch manage. So, <coughs> interestingly, excuse me, um, I've just got a piece of chocolate cake stuck in my throat that uh, Jana brought for me. Jana, in case you're wondering, is Steph's lovely wife. And um, that's not really relevant to the wildebeest story, but I thought I would tell you anyway. <coughs> oh, I've lost my tra train of thought now. <laughs> Um, right. Oh, yes, hump-backed whales. Hump-backed whales, anyway, big distance. I'm going to find out exactly how far it is that they go and how many of them migrate. While I do that, let us go back to the five musketeers with Scott Disson. They should be popping in soon. All good? Sorry, uh, there was some problem with our audio there, so apologies for that, but basically these guys are still in the mo on the move, still heading west, and time will tell whether they decide to cross the Talek River. Now, they haven't been this far north for quite a few days. They, we're still getting to work out their territory, and it seems to be fluctuating quite a bit at the moment, according to the researchers. They're pressing further and further south into the reserve, whereas they've usually been spending time on the opposite side of this riverbed. This, that was the first place I ever saw them, on the opposite side. And they may want to go back and ensure that all their territorial boundary points have been well marked and that everything is in order. Now, they're not incredibly full-bellied, but they are well-fed, so they could well chase something if they come across it, which would be absolutely wonderful, because to see the fastest mammal on the planet doing its business is quite a thing. Hello to John Michael. You would like to know if I've ever seen a king cheetah, and sadly, no, I haven't. And for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, I can show you one very quickly. It made the front cover of my mammal book. So just a quick glimpse. And basically they're a melanistic form, so they're just a darker form, and their spots are kind of interconnected. Very, very pretty. They are quite common in captivity because once you have the gene, you can breed it quite successfully. But in the wild, they are very, very rare. I guess they could be likened to white lions, which do occur in the wild, but very rarely. I think there's two or three in the, Kruger, in the entire Kruger National Park at the moment, and that is the main area that white lions are found. Yet in zoos and captivity, there are hundreds upon hundreds of white lions. So again, it's something easy that's, it's something easy that us as humans can intervene and help create, but not very common out in nature. And I'd be interested to know if there are any reports of King Cheetah in the Mara. I haven't heard of any. What I find interesting with these guys, and the two that are in shots are good examples thereof, is that the bigger cheetah seem to have a bigger white tuft on the end of their tail, whereas the smaller cheetah in this coalition don't have as big as a white tuft. And I've noticed this individual that we're looking at here, plus the other male with the collar, have got the two biggest white patches on the end of their tail, whereas the three smaller ones have got less white. So I'm not sure if that's something that's going to develop with age or size or if it's just a genetic difference. Hello Lady Starfire, you would like to know how far will these animals move on an average day? Well, on one evening between sunset and 11 o'clock at night, they moved 
8 kilometers as the crow flies, so probably a minimum of 10 kilometers because they don't walk in a dead straight line, which is 6 miles. And prior to that, they had walked about another 10 miles that day. So 15 miles in a day is not difficult for them to cover, but it will vary, you know, and it's the same with lions. They're not going to move set distances each day, anywhere from naught miles if they're full, up to 5, 10, 15, 20 depending on what's going on, food, competition, other cheetahs who may be lurking in the area. Okay, well, it appears like we need to now loop ahead of them again. Wonderful! Okay, well, while we get into a better spot, we will be spending you to a better spot with James. Indeed, everybody, a uh, better spot, I'm not sure. Look, not much going on here at all. I just decided they's going to have a little bit of a rest on the banks today. Well, some of them going around to the south. Maybe they'll go all the way to Dusty Crossing. Maybe they've just decided there. But of course, that is the great drama of the wildebeest migration, is that it is as unpredictable as the weather, the economy, and indeed my mother's moods. I hope she's not watching. There you can see them moving away. Now, I mean, I know, don't lose hope. If you were hoping to see a crossing, many of you would probably be quite relieved so that you won't see the trauma of a crossing. But what they often do is turn around, do exactly that thing, and then one or two of them decide, no, hang on, we've spent all this time here, let's go back across. And that's what they do. But now they seem to be moving up onto the hill. Adele, you wonder if we will see other kinds of antelope cross. Uh, of course, a, a wildebeest is an antelope. You say, do we ever see ant uh, impala cross? No, I haven't seen impala cross. I think it's unlikely that they would. I suspect quite uh, without any form of scientific backing that impala are actually quite intelligent. I've seen topi do it, so yes, other antelope do do it. Gazelles, Thompsons, I haven't seen Grants do it. Um, and certainly I think the Eland do it from time to time. Yellow-billed stork just making his way off to a better fishing grounds. And so, yeah, there are a number of different animals that will do it. And, of course, the zebra do it. But they ain't antelope, are they? Right, I think we should just have a look at the mountain cam if we can. Are we able to go to the mountain cam, Rebecca? Oh, thank you so much. Your kindness is beyond imagining. There we have the mountain cam. And what I wanted to show you was the fact that it is still raining. You can see the drips going, but also there was such a lovely rainbow here, which has unfortunately disappeared, which is a bit sad. But, wait, I get to get my first good bird sighting in a tree from here. A bird has just flown in here. You will be pleased to know that the... Oh, there we go. Oh! That is my friend, of course, the Bergfecht weaver. And I was hoping not to have to show you him to you on the windowsill, but you can see that's where he has flown to again. You will notice that ladders are difficult to come by here in Kenya, and so we build our own, and someone is going to die on one of them fairly soon. That I have no doubt. There we have Mr. Bergfecht. Good morning, good afternoon, Mr. Bergfecht. There you are, and many of you were doing a bird list or are keeping a Kenyan bird list and I know somebody had a bird list of something like 50 which is quite impressive and so I, I think you probably got Bergfecht Weaver on it and that was Lady Starfire I suspect you've already got him because we've seen him sitting there the last few afternoons anyway we had her missus in the tree earlier and unfortunately she's now on the windowsill but why shouldn't she be a little bit of shelter there. All right, let's go back to the crossing. Uh, that is main crossing north. And there we are. Well then, Rebecca. Now you see they've stopped moving. One or two have turned around. And then he's still moving.
Alinda, you've asked a question about whether the big predators eat the drowned wildebeest and zebra. They would if they could get them away from the crocodiles. So certainly, as we've seen at Juma many, many times, a lion has got the taste buds, well, of uh, somebody who doesn't have taste buds. They are perfectly happy to eat the most rancid and foul meat in the world, hyenas likewise, and if they could get at, and I'm sure they do from time to time, rotting carcasses in the water, I've no doubt that they'd eat them very happily. So as you say, when darkness sets in, the crocodiles go onto the land. I think a crocodile's major sort of um, priority being an ectotherm is to keep its body temperature at a, in a state that is, is most comfortable. And so I think you'll find that these crocs here are out of the water because it's a little chilly there. Of course, at night here, down on the valley floor there, it can drop to around about 13 degrees Celsius with a chilly wind chill, so put it down to say eight or nine, and that of course sits at around, well, just say between 50 and 60 degrees Fahrenheit. It can go down that cold, and therefore the crocodile or any reptile is going to choose probably not to be in the water. They're going to choose to be out of the wind, so if it's warmer in the water, out of the wind, then that's where they'll be. Otherwise, they'll tuck themselves in behind one of these sort of uh, grassy banks, if you like. All righty, we're going to leave these indecisive white-bearded gnus and head across to Scott with his much more decisive band of brothers. Oh, a little bit of playtime. I'm not sure what got them excited there. They all stopped and sniffed the ground simultaneously and now they're rolling around in it. So something urinated or defecated there and they are simply loving it. Sometimes predators will roll in the dung of their prey. I'm not sure why they do that. They sometimes even lick the dung of herbivores in order to get minerals and certain nutrients that I guess they lack in their diet. Sadly, there's a small ridge in the way, and we are parked very far ahead of them now in the knowledge that they are going to be making their way all the way to this tree, which I'm almost certain they will scent mark on. They're quite predictable animals, so we thought we'd get a nice, good head start and wait for them to come down to us. H. Macy, you would like to know if cheetah can climb trees as well as any of the other cats can. And no, they are not good climbers. Their claws, like a dog's, are always sticking out. So unlike a lion and a leopard that can protract their claws when they would like to latch onto something or climb a tree, the cheetahs do not have that. Their claws are always a little bit out, which is useful for when they are sprinting. They can climb up kind of trees with a 45 degree limb or small stumps but it's not pretty and they certainly cannot be considered good climbers nor can lion really most lion are terrible climbers some may be slightly better than others uh, they just pop behind them. well we'll let those guests enjoy while we wait patiently as we've been all day <laughs> we also thought we'd get up onto this little ridge to see if there was any possible prey which there is and I'm not certain that these five boys are going to be hugely enticed by Thompson's gazelle. I think that they know that they're difficult to catch and then it's a small meal for the five boys to share. However, anything is possible. They did catch a little fawn the other night after dark, which was very interesting. So, in theory, cheetahs do hunt after dark, but it was more of an opportunistic hunt. They flushed a little fawn from its hiding place in the grass and then they just pounced on it. We basically blinked and missed everything. But next thing we knew there was a young fawn in the cheetah's mouth. So they will take opportunities as they are presented with them. But I'm more inclined to believe that these guys know that wildebeest, especially now that they are quite numerous in these parts, are going to be the prey of choice. Hopefully they prove me wrong. What's interesting is that I haven't spent a lot of time in this area, but 
Since I was here a few days ago, there have definitely been more wildebeest moving north into the area. So there is more prey. What's interesting is these guys decided to actually move away from the large herds of wildebeest, which are a little bit to the south of us. This is kind of just north of where the front runners of the migration are. And our patience paid off. Here they come. This is very beautiful. Hello, Liz. You'd like to know if I think these large coalitions of cheetah that are being documented are an evolutionary change or adaption. I'm not entirely certain of that. And what I, ooh, why are they looking more intent? And if you look at the cheetah in the middle, he is the one that has led all of the hunts. There's a topi there. Okay. Hold on, everyone. We need to, we need to get into a better position. Hold on to your handbags and your wallets and your shoes. They are heading straight towards the lone topi over here. And what I want to do is get into position where we're going to be able to allow Dave to be able to film the full <clears throat> hunt if it does in fact happen. It's always a bit of guesswork and lottery as to what's going to happen. But I'm going to decide to try and get onto kind of the other side of this topi and see what happens. I'm not sure if you guys agreed, their body language definitely changed and the fact that they didn't come to that tree also had me wondering what was up. And because these animals move so quickly, I do not want to take any chances in not being in the right place to capture some what will possibly be crazy footage. Oof, this is going to be tricky. So you can't really see the cheetah from where we are. But we can see the topi, and that's who we've got to keep in our sights because that is what the cheetah are keeping in their sights. It's just a bit of a dot in the center of your screen. Let's just stop here. I'm going to have a quick scan with my binocular machines to reassess where the cheetah are because I've kind of lost track a bit but yeah we can't see the cheetah you can definitely see what they're heading towards though and what I'm doing is I'm looking at the tourists on the other vehicle to see where their heads are pointed and all is still looking promising I just want to get us onto a slightly bit more higher ground the thing is with filming a cheetah hunt is you need to kind of think very far in advance because they move so quickly, they can disappear out of view, they can run behind you, anything can happen and on this kind of ridge I'm worried that they may chase the topi out of sight. I think the topi may have seen them now. It's just turned and stopped and looked in their direction. It's not looking hugely distressed. Oh, it's so tricky to decide where to stop. Okay, I think I can see the head of a cheetah on the horizon to the right of the topi there. If you just pan a little bit to the right, was I imagining things? Zoom in a bit. Zoom in there. Here we go. Look at this. We have got ourselves into an epic, epic spot. Now it'll be interesting to see who the front runner is. Like I said, the individual with the collar is usually the one that I've noticed leads the charge. Look at how incredible this view is. The topi has got no idea that these cheats are making their way towards it. And unlike lion and leopard, they don't have to get nearly as close to their prey. They could unleash at any moment, but I'm guessing they're going to try and get as close as they can. As soon as it detects them, that is when they will start running. And so will it. So we can see three. If you just pan a little bit to the left, Darby, I just want to make sure the fifth cheetah is not to the left of that fourth one we can see. So we can see, did one cheetah just roll over there quite playfully? I think it did. 
So obviously one of them's not as focused as it needs to be. Just try and frame down a bit, Dav, if you can. Because of the background. Davi, Sorry. try and frame down a little bit because of the background there. Just you know, frame those other things out of the shots. We're going to battle to do that. Okay. Well, everyone, I'm just going to keep quiet and let the rest take course on its own because no words can describe what we are about to see now. Don't look at us, buddy. You're looking the wrong way. I think I can start speaking again now because things have calmed down, but at any moment, these cheetah could explode into full charge. It's difficult to gauge how far away they are at the moment, but I'm guessing they're kind of about 50 meters. They would ideally start chasing at around 30 or 40 meters, so they're not far off their kind of maximum range that they'll start chasing from but they're being very clever because this animal's actually slowly feeding towards them so rather than them giving away their presence by moving if they just lie still this topi could edge closer and closer towards them what to do and where to go. Um, I think we are good where we are here for now. Look at the cheetah's head poking over the termite mound to the right of it. Now, David, you don't think that five cheetah could bring down a topi. I can assure you they can because they take down larger prey than Topi and that, that's, that's fact. They've been seen taking down fully grown wildebeest. So don't be, don't be fooled by their slender frames and their slight build. They can and will wrestle down large prey. And that's certainly attributed to the fact that there are five of them. As far as I'm aware, there's one kind of ringleader with regards to cat latching onto the prey and the other four come barreling in and help then subdue it. Whew. Now it's best to stay where we are, even though we're kind of at quite a distance from them. If they start running, they'll be past us in a heartbeat. So... That's why we decided to rather stay as far as we possibly can. That way we'll also have the least impact on the sighting. And as you can see, or have seen, since everything has unfolded, we have had very, very little or no effect on these animals' behavior. And that is very important. We don't want to in any way alter Mother Nature's plans. We merely want to spectate. Well, our patience today has paid off. Already the excitement of what may or may not happen is worth it, but we may need to employ a little bit more patience. Uh, James, you've just asked if this dominant male cheetah within this coalition who I think is the one with the collar will enforce his dominance 
I'm not sure with regards to what he would enforce his dominance. Are you saying at the meal, would he kick the other ones out of a good spot? Yeah, okay, that is what you were wanting to know. And not that I've seen. They've been quite placid feeders. Oh, okay, now anything could happen now because he's stopped and he's looking very intently where that one cheetah was. And once he realizes they're there and he starts running away, that will trigger them to chase him. And I've got a feeling, maybe he just sensed something, but he's not too sure. Let's see if we can see the cheetah, Dave. Where well, they've still tucked behind these little mounds, doing a good job to conceal themselves. I don't want to run the risk of moving because if they start chasing him and we moving, we will miss everything. So I think we're just going to sit tight where we are here. And I'm confident that he will probably start running towards us. Judging that they're on the opposite side of him, he's going to want to get as much distance between himself and them as possible. And that will, I'm guessing, bring him in this direction. Now, even though we can't see much at the moment, I think it's definitely worth sticking around in a blink of an eye. The chase, be it a failed or a successful one, could be over. So don't go anywhere. Cancel whatever plans you had, because you'll be some or very few to witness a live cheetah kill. What you should probably do is actually get a hold of some of your friends and tell them to tune in. Hello, John Michael. You would like to know how much bigger is a wildebeest than a topi? I would say on average a good 50 to 80 kilograms bigger, depending on whether it's a male or, or a female, of course. But they are considerably larger beasts, beasts than the topi. Kind of trying to get a little bit of extra height here. Sorry, that's why the camera's wobbling. To see what the boys are doing. They're just kind of lying flat in the grass. Hmm. Now, it's not uncommon for predators to change tact. I've seen it a lot of times with leopard. A leopard will be in full stalk, and the next thing you know, it'll be sleeping with a herd of impala 20 meters away. So it seems like these cheetahs may have adopted a similar kind of situation. I am just going to reposition ever so slightly quickly. Kobe, good to have you with us again. You would like to know, are Topi fast? And yes, they are very quick, but not quicker than a cheetah. However, what they can do is they can rely on their ability to run from side to side and kind of jinx. And that way, the cheetah can go streaming past them and then have to realign their, their course of hunting. So. There we go, that's a good shot there. You got them there, Dave, just straight behind them. Yeah. If you just zoom straight in, you'll get all of them there. Okay, so now you've got a much better idea of where three of the cheats are. They're just lying in the grass behind him there. He, I think, has smelt some kind of a rat, but not sure what exactly it is that he's seen. But he, he can feel something's kind of up. The wind is in the cheetah's favor. The wind is blowing from left to right, so there's no chance that he would have smelt them. But he may have just seen those bumps and thought, oh, those look a little bit strange. So there's three that we can see there. 
The fourth and the fifth, I'm not too sure. I know the one is further off. To the right of it, so I can see the fourth one. But the fifth one is unaccounted for. Interesting. The fourth, the, yeah, on the further, yeah, there's the... There's the uh, that's the fourth and the fifth there. Yeah, there's one on the right and the two one and the one to the left. So that's it. All five of them poised and ready. And I'm almost certain that it'll be the collared male, which looks like it's the one on the far left, that will spearhead the chase, and the rest will follow on afterwards. Nguyen, good to have you with us. You would like to know why is this topi all on its own? And he's just probably an old boy who's tired of running around after ladies and dealing with young adolescent men and happy to live a life on his own. It's not uncommon to see topi especially on their own. I think they're just like having some peace and quiet when they get a bit older. And the same goes for wildebeest. You also get lone male wildebeest. Sometimes they join up into small herds, but it's not uncommon to get certain species like this who are not afraid to be loners, and the topi is certainly one of them. Often iconic scenes from the Masai Mara of these topi perched up on termite mounds with space and grass all around them and no other animals in sight. Brian, good question. You wondering whether it's probably not the wisest time to be hunting with all the other apex predators in this area coming to life, like lion and hyena. They are definitely more active in the in the in the evening into the night. And yes, it is. But wherever they hunt, they kind of run the risk of losing their prey to either lion, leopard, or hyena. There are so many of all those species in this area that at any point, at any time, whatever kill they make could be stolen. So probably not ideal. I guess the middle of the day would be their most likely time not to create a stir. But then again, it's the hottest time of the day. So, ooh. Bit of movement. And there's an important lesson for all of us to learn here, and it's a very simple one, and that is that if you do not run away from these animals, they very often do not chase you. So they need that flight of their prey to trigger that instinctual desire to chase them down. And it's at that moment when this topi realizes what's in front of it and he turns on his heels that they will hammer down after him. Oh! Now this warthog is gonna possibly come and chase these cheetah. I've seen it happen the other day with these five males and water can be very, very, very cheeky and brave. So who knows? Now, these cheetahs would have done the maths. They know how quickly these topi can run and possibly just think they don't have quite a close enough starting point to be able to catch up to this guy or they may just feel it's not going to be an efficient use of their energy. Hmm. I'm thinking of possibly repositioning again ever so slightly. So bear with me, everyone. Okay, we're gonna shoot you across to James. Actually, no, I don't think it's worth running the risk. You can just stay with us. <laughs> we thought about shooting you off to a river cam for a quick view of what's happening there, but if something were to happen now, I would feel like we've made a terrible decision. Uh, OK. 
Okay. So you can still see the cheetah all just dotting out there. Some look like they're fast asleep, others look a little bit more focused. I mean, they could possibly be waiting for dusk, for it to get a little bit darker, a little bit trickier for this topi to know what it's dealing with. We have seen them bring down a, a kill in kind of the early morning dawn twilight when it was still not light enough to use or to not use our infrared camera. All five cheetah in shot now. Not it. <laughs> Three of them there and then two further. Come on, boys, what are you thinking? How's it? <laughs> well, Machines just made quite a funny comment saying the cheetah are wondering whether it's going to be bacon or beef tonight. And interestingly, bacon is not a very easy resource to come by in these parts due to the fact that the owners of the bacon are, like I said, quite brave and they actually stand up to quite large prey. Warthogs are one of the most bold animals I've seen considering their size, and female warthog will chase after leopard if a leopard grabs their young they've even been known to stand up to lion <clears throat> and like i said just a few days ago a warthog came running up to these five cheetah and, and kind of like mock charged them the cheetah actually got a fright and ran off so even though cheetahs certainly do hunt warthog i think when there's so much easier abundant prey that's less dangerous they prefer to stick to the the beef option Well, how fascinating is this? I really thought something would have unfolded by now. But then again, like I said a little bit earlier, the cheetah is the one big cat that I've spent the least time with in my career as a safari guide. Most places I've worked have had very few cheetahs. So I'm loving the fact that together we are going to learn a lot about what these animals do. And this is a really, really interesting insight into their hunting methods. Topi must be wondering why it's so popular. There's a few vehicles, all very well positioned, I must say, way out of the way of the action, all eagerly anticipating what may go down. And if the slopey, if the slopey, if the topi just lies down, then we'll have a full on slumber party in the middle of the plains here. quite an interesting journey home after this all unfolds our plan was to leave this area 25 minutes ago but of course that was as soon as all this action started unfolding so now we are forced to stay how are you doing with the low light here Dav if things start well, yeah, it's no, good. Okay, but in terms of the the, the low light, the gate, all all's all good to time. I'm just making checking in with Dave there because the light is d dwindling quickly, and when you're filming the fastest mammal on the planet, it can make things tricky if you don't have good light. But he says everything is as under control as it can be. Hello, Sandra. 
You would like to know if one of these males got injured in one way or another, whether the other males would bring it food. Um, it's highly unlikely that it would survive if it was disabled to a point that it cannot walk. So they may kill food and they may allow it to hobble along and then eat it, having not contributed to the kill, but they are certainly not going to be uh, taking takeaways back and forwards to a disabled cheetah elsewhere. So, no, they will not do that, but they will certainly tolerate, and I'm, I'm fairly certain it's already happening with the four cheetah who don't seem to be as productive when it comes to the hunting. The lead guy does the, mo the majority of the work, and then he's happy to let the others all eat because they do get protection and a lot of affection, I guess. They've got grown strong bonds with one another that allow each person to contribute to the coalition in their own way, I guess. <laughs> well, Di, another funny comment, thank you. You've just said, considering that these guys are the policemen of the bush, it's not seeming very alert. It could be that uh, he's off shift, or it's just uh, a phony, somebody dressed up in a police uniform, pretending. <laughs> Surely, guys. What more do you want this topi to do? The thing is, it's not feeding towards them. It's feeding parallel to where they are. So it's not, I don't think it's getting huge, you know, much closer to them. I guess they're possibly worried that they are clearly in its field of view now. Whereas before, maybe when it had its head down and it was facing the opposite way, it wasn't, or it wouldn't have been as easy for it to see them. Okay, we are going to send you across to some other epic action in the Mara. Well, it's not that epic. We're just going to have a quick look, everybody. One zebra has made it across the river. His two friends are the other side. We'll just quickly see. Oh, there is a crocodile waiting for them. And I, that's why I decided we should maybe come and have a look here. We will keep an eye on those topi. Here we go. Now we've got some serious action. Big crocodile, young zebra. What's going to happen here? It's made it. Other one's made it. Oh, had a go. Got him. No, kicked him off. You. Wow. Okay, well, that was very exciting. That crocodile left the youngster, grabbed the big one on the back. There you are, you skullduggerous fellow. And because the zebra could stand, because it could kick off the ground, the crocodile, even with the, those clamping jaws, had absolutely no chance at all. Fantastic. Right, back to the cheetah. They're on the move. OK. Now, it's Murphy's law that as soon as you leave us, these guys did start up and started creeping after this topi. And I guess it's because it was walking directly away from them. So they all paced forward a few steps while it was facing directly in the opposite direction. Then as soon as it stopped and turned, they flattened themselves to the ground. So they're doing the best they can when it's not looking in their direction to sneak up a few yards on towards it. But you can see it's now moved off a fair distance from how much closer it was earlier. Let's stay on the cheetah because I'm fairly certain they're going to get up and start following it again now. There they are. So I'll keep on an eye on the topi for you, but like I said, they are in all likelihood going to get up now and keep following it now that it's moving directly away from them. Sky, you would like to know how far the cheetah are away. At the moment, I would guess their distance away from this topi is about 100 meters, possibly even a little bit more. The closest it came to them was about 50 meters. It's tricky because as soon as Dave zooms out, the cheetah's camouflage is so good, it's hard to know where exactly we left them tucked away in the grass. Come on, boys. What are you waiting for? Yeah. 
Interestingly, the one who I've got the most faith in is the furthest cheater away. He's actually just out of frame to the left. That's him there. And he has been certainly dominant when it comes to chasing down the prey that we've seen them successfully catch. So now that things have calmed down here, if the excitement at the river crossing is still unfolding, it may be worth heading back there. Because I feel like these boys have given us a bit of a tease. But a very, very enjoyable tease. Okay, well, the things have seemed to have calmed down at the crossing, so you'll be enjoying a beautiful sunset from there. There we have a beautiful sunset from here, everybody, as uh, predicted by Scott. Well done, Scott. The wildebeest I will show you shortly are leaving Maine South again. Oh, isn't that lovely? Let's see how good this camera really is. Gosh. Now, of course, Scott has got to get through that enormous cloud before he gets home. But, of course, these considerations should not worry me as I am sitting high and dry in the migration control room. There we go. Now, before they totally disappear, let's quickly head across to Main North. There they are. Now, you see the wildebeest came all the way back. And that herd, in fact, that is standing there on the bank ha has halved in size in the last sort of, I don't know, five minutes or so while you've been watching that rather enjoyable sort of scene playing out on the plains there with the cheetah. And they came all the way down. They looked like they might decide to cross again in the same place that they did yesterday. And then, well, they turned around and went away again. Stacey, you say, why do some herds migrate and one her some herds stay resident? Stacey, um, th that is not a simple... It's, it's a simple question with a very complicated answer, I think. First of all, I don't think that all wildebeest either belong to a sedentary or to a migratory herd. In other words, I think that you'll find that some of them remain all year sometimes and then migrate the next year, some of them migrate one year and then not again the next year. So let me just say that. Some of them might become part of that loiter herd, if you like, that goes up to the north and migrates into this area at this time of the year uh, from the north. And uh, Some of them, uh, look, I, would, I think it's quite, would be strange if some of them swapped between those two herds, but I think it's possible. But the answer is, Stacey, that they will go wherever there is food. Now, we know, ooh, here come a whole lot more down to the river. We know, of course, that many wildebeest in this con on this continent, they're coming down to the river. Can you believe it? Many wildebeest on this continent do not ever cross rivers. They don't ever migrate. The ones in the Sabi sand, for example, are a very good example of those that don't move, which means that they are not, by definition, a migratory species. They can migrate, they will if they have to, but they don't necessarily need to. Now, what is going on here? Who has decided that this is a good idea? I cannot imagine. It was that chap right in front. He turned around, he thought, no ways, I've been dallying about, fannying about enough, now I'm going. Here we go. And the rest of the thought, oh, yes, 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 let's, yes, let's, let's go along too. Here we go, we're underway with the Wildebeest crossing at Main North, and the picture's frozen. No, it's unfrozen. This is fantastic. Now, look, word is spreading amongst the herd. They've turned round and they're all coming back. Oh, no, the front chap seems to have lost his nerve. And therefore, all of them, no, they're just going to have a drink. You see, I don't think these things know what they're doing. And in much the same way as we have absolutely no idea, truly, what drives these things to cross the river, we have absolutely no idea, I believe, truly, what drives them to migrate. Yes, of course, it's food and water that they need. But what makes them go where they go, well, we're just not sure. You know, we talk about the storms, we talk about the grass, we talk about all sorts of things like that, postulations. But the variables at play in a story like this are just myriad and often too difficult for us to actually understand or comprehend. No, decided no. That is very disappointing. Come on. You've made it some of the way. There go the yellow-billed storks. 
They've had enough of waiting for this lot to make up their minds. Having a drink, don't see any crocs. If you say, do migrating herds go to the same, do the same? I think it's the same migrating herds go to the same crossings each year. And I don't know. Uh, I think they probably do. But I think what you'll find is older ones go to where they know to cross and the younger ones follow. And by the time they get back to Tanzania, well, then they kind of know where the crossing points are. But I'm not sure if they all always go to the same place to cross the rivers. So, I mean, have these chaps crossed down south as well? I don't know. Come on, get in the water. Come on now. I've just had a feeling that this wasn't going to actually happen today. I feel like it's too late in the day, that it hasn't been a particularly warm day, and I think that does play a role said it wasn't a warm day yesterday either. I know John Michael, you say, why is this large herd not attracting uh, predators on this side of the river? John Michael, I can assure you it is. And I can assure you that there are lions around here uh, thinking about eating all of these wildebeest. And, well, it's entirely possible that as darkness falls, they will sort of lay claim to one of them. But remember, we watched a lioness take one of them earlier today at this crossing. So it might be that the Paradise Pride is just too full of wildebeest to be worrying about it at this stage. There they are. Yeah, just oh, the endless prevarication, isn't there? The punters have all had to go home, unfortunately, for them. There, you can see, oh, no, there's still some of them there. Some, of course, have got big distances to travel and they must get out of the reserve or back into camp before the reserve closes. Let's go back to Main South if we can and we'll just have a look at that pretty sunset. And there it is. See how pretty it is? That's the back of the cars, and the crossing point is just over the top there. So that's what's going on there. Complete peace on this part of the river. Very gentle scene going on. And we did, as you know, just watch a crossing at Cul-de-Sac, a massive crossing of three zebra, and all of them made it. Ah, now... Norm, you're wondering what animals we see up in the mountains and whether we see them on the mountain cam. Norm, we see all sorts up here. Topi, giraffe, zebra, wildebeest from time to time. Currently, I'm watching a person on the mountain cam walking from side to side. We see, of course, bergfecht uh, weavers quite frequently, a number of other bird species. And uh, what else do we get up here? We definitely get hippo and elephant up here from time to time. So we see all sorts up here on the mountain. Let's go back to the crossing, main two. There we are. Yeah, I think that this is not going to turn into a crossing. Still one or two of them having a prevarication, perhaps just seeking out a little bit of water. Well, they've got that, haven't they? I've certainly got some water. We'll just give them a few more minutes and see if they get into the water. If you're wondering what happened to Juma, well, I know we were supposed to be joined about them. Technical glitches, I'm afraid, precluded us coming to you live from Juma today, where, well, I don't know what they would have found. It was so nice to see the wintry landscape there from this morning. And hopefully next time they will be back. Oh, looking like maybe thinking about crossing. Ah, now, Jimmy, this is a very good question, and I think is I've got an interesting answer. You say, would the herds stampede into the river were 
they to be chased by lions from behind? The answer, Jimmy, is no, I don't think they would. Unless there were three or four lions blocking every available exit route, then I think they would go for the river. Some might plunge into the river, but many would plunge in all the, you know, they'd take off in all sorts of directions. Remember, one lioness causing a panic is, uh, say, one degree out of 360 that they could run. And into the water is clearly dangerous for them. They know that. And I think even in a panic, they would possibly choose to run along the bank, uh, back up the other way. And the interesting thing that I've watched the zebra doing when they've been harassed by the Angama pride is that they seem to turn uphill. It's almost like they don't want to run down. They know that they're much less stable running downhill. And so they turn up rather than down and then run. And of course, oh, here we go. Because they're taller than lions, they have a longer stride and can possibly therefore run uphill faster. I don't know. I mean, that's just an observation of mine. Hmm. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. If you're wondering what's happened to Scott, he's left those cheetah. Uh, he's had to also, much like the punters here, get out of the reserve on time. And also, uh, Brent Leo Smith has headed for home. I don't know where he is yet. He, he got rather wet, I'm afraid. We obviously have to watch the equipment and look after it very carefully because we have a television show to cater for very soon. Shall we have another look at the sunset, Rebecca? While we wait for Scott to arrive. There we are. You can see the sun has now, in fact, set. Casting a lovely orange glow upon the river, wherein the hippopotamus make their peaceful grunt. And the gnus, of course, at Main 2, are going. Bang, 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 bang. Wild Bill, you said that you think they're waiting for what kind of a party? Ah, the maitre be to call Wildebeer's party of 2017. Well, let me play that game. Wildebeest party of 2017 now. No, nothing. Well, Billy, you were wrong, I'm afraid. I'm sorry about that. We're still going to watch them. See what happens. And apparently we've lost Scott almost entirely, and so for the next 17 minutes we're going to be watching the crossings. Send through your questions, hashtag Safari Live. Let's start a conversation, please. But I'm also just keeping an eye on all the other crossings to see for pretty scenes and interesting bits and pieces that might be going on. Unfortunately, some of the crossings seem to develop minds of their own, which is very distressing. Okay, now what I want to do is look at the bird that was over here. Uh, the yellow billed stork lives completely unhurried or irritated by the migration, as far as I can tell. Now, I think this is a rather interesting place for a yellow billed stork to be fishing in the rapids like this. I think it can't be easy. Obviously they've got some form of grippy material on the bottom of their feet which allows them to stand on these rocks which you and I would certainly slip off and certainly things like wildebeest and zebra slip off all the time, slicing their legs and um, potentially breaking their legs but they don't seem to do that very often which surprises me. I wonder if it wasn't behind that log that that lioness was hiding earlier. Bree, Bree, you say, what would my strategy be for crossing the river? My strategy would be to go down to the Purungat Bridge and walk across it. Uh, that would be my one and only strategy. I am, have a very healthy fear of crocodiles. I know 
of three, and I know two people who've been bitten by a crocodile, one of whom did not resurface, the other of whom, uh, well, he's just got a bit missing from his leg. It's not actually too bad. It was nasty at the time, but he's okay now. And so I just, you, it would be difficult to pay me enough to get into the water here. There's a rather dreadful story in the Kruger Park of a, well, naturally booze had something to do with it, but there were some guys at the golf club at Skukuza, which is just inside the Kruger Park. Very nice if you can play golf there. Don't do what these guys did. Had one too many at the 10th hole. There are only nine holes on the golf course. And they decided they would go swimming in the dam one night after many, too many, probably, castle lagers, and one of them was eaten by a crocodile. So no matter where you think you are in Africa, unless you can see the bottom of the water body that you're going to get into, you must assume that there will be a crocodile. Obviously, this does not apply to the swimming pools and sort of the northern suburbs of Johannesburg. There are unlikely to be crocodiles in there, but well, you just never know. Natalie, you want to know how strong the current is? I'm not sure how to give it to you in uh, units other than sort of very, not very, quite a lot. You know what I mean? I don't know how to measure the flow, but I will tell you it's, it's stronger, I think, than it has been. Uh, well, probably about as strong as it was yesterday, but not as strong, but much stronger than it was two days ago. And I think there's definitely been some rain up in the catchment area of the Mao Escarpment, some 250 miles away from the, uh, from the mouth of the river, which goes into Lake Victoria. So I think you'll find that it's maybe creating some consternation amongst these wildebeest, but we really don't know why they cross, to be honest. Ah, right, now Rebecca would like to see dusty crossing and the birds fluttering about the hippos. I think it's a very good idea. Oh, there's a hippo having a yawn for you. Frozen, no, not frozen anymore. And I love this crossing normally at this time of the day, but there's obviously a cloud sitting above it, which means that the water has not turned pink like it can sometimes at this angle, uh, which uh, doesn't make it less attractive, but it's not quite as attractive. And you can see that this is a very wide section of the river and uh, very calm as a result of that, not many rocks. But you can see the banks on the left there very, very steep, and that's probably why the wildebeest don't cross there. Now, Mad Candy, you're wondering about whether the birds hatch all their eggs before the herds are stampede around here. Uh, Mad Candy, I, I don't think that there's a huge number of... There's not a great deal of stampeding that goes on. It's a good question. I wonder if perhaps the lapwings don't perhaps have their youngsters earlier, uh, earlier in the year to avoid having the wildebeest around and the chances of having them stomped on. But, uh, yeah, I wonder. I wonder if there's ever been a study done about that. That's quite interesting. When I say they don't stampede, it doesn't... You know, often that galloping throng of animals it does happen from time to time, but it doesn't... It's not the norm. All right, I think let's go back to Main North. You can see they've jumped out of the water again. One fellow thinking about crossing. Hmm. Now, a question from someone called The Nets Rack. The Nets Rack. You say if they decide to cross, will they stay so close to the water all night long? I think they'll move away. I think that the danger of lions and crocodiles are more easily avoided on the open grasses away from the water and in an area where they can run away much more effectively. Now, what I want to do, I'm just going to quickly scan from side to side. No. Let's go to Main South, Rebecca, if we can. There, we've gone to Main South. And there is the rest of that herd. It's the same herd, 
You can see them moving away from the water, possibly for the night. Now the picture is going to get a bit grainy as we head towards darkness. But there they all are. And, uh, oh, that's from Governor's Camp. They're going home now. They've got a long way to drive. Anyway, you can see the wind is also howling out there now as the sun has gone down. But this is where the bulk of the herd, I think, is going to spend the night. I think up on these plains. Jeepers, it's a lot of wildebeestes. And I wonder if it's not the same group that was set upon during, well, probably at about one o'clock this afternoon by the Paradise Pride, one of the lionesses, and perhaps, you know, it's definitely made them run away from the river. And I wonder if this is not the same group who still have yet to cross the river. As far as I'm concerned, very wise idea on their part. Plenty of grass there, you can see. Keepers, look at this line. Diana, you're wondering about the Juma type of wildebeest and if we ever get them here. Remember, this is the same species. It's a slightly different subspecies. This is called the white-bearded gnu. The one we get in, at Juma is just this plain old blue gnu. I think sometimes called the brindled gnu as well. And she possesses a huge group of animals. And so you don't find them here. No, this, this subspecies occurs up here. And down in southern Africa, you have a different subspecies. Let's go back to the northern crossing. And there we are. And you can see now they're all starting to dwindle up towards the hills as the light starts to fade. There we go. Beautiful. Now, let's have one last look, I think, at the mountain cam. Ah, there is a person. Hello, good evening. And zebra. I think let's go to the zebra. That man thinks he's in private. He's not, of course. There's no privacy in a, in a camp where you film live safaris. In fact, there's even a camera in the, in the, uh, in the pantry. There must be. Mount we eat. Can we go to the pantry cam? Or is that not possible? Uh, apparently we can't. Apparently we can't go to live feed of the pantry cam. That's a pity. Now these zebra come up out of the valley floor during the night. They're all amongst our tents. You hear them grazing. They don't sleep much, interestingly. It's actually quite... I haven't thought about this. They don't sleep at night. They eat. They eat all night long outside our tents. And then maybe they go off down into the valley to snooze during the day. I'm not sure. But they come bungling up here. There is some topi behind the camp as well, quite often. Lots of giraffe often. And there, we'll just quickly look up into, or down into the valley. See if we can't spot the Angama pride, perhaps, on the hunt. There we can see two people coming up from Game Drive. They're from Angama Mara. Oh, goody, there's the nuclear family. No, there's elephants. No, they're not. Are they? No, they're elephants, yes. They're elephants, fantastic. And a tiny little baby there. Obviously getting... A Look, it's chasing its big brother. Big brother not happy with it. That's very cute. That's very sweet. The nuclear family I'm referring to is a bull, cow and calf buffalo who have issued life in the herd and have decided to raise their child alone uh, on, the play, on the slopes of the Olu Lolo escarpment. Now you can see the picture is getting a bit grainy, it's just because it's getting quite dark. Let's go across to um, Maine North again. See how the wildebeest are disappearing. There they all go. Oh, what a nice question. Um, from Lendy or Wendy? Glendy. Golf Glendy. Right, Glendy, I'll tell you what, I'm rather sick and tired of these pictures here. So what I'm going to do is show you a map in the studio. Just give me one second to set it up, Rebecca. 
Just a few seconds, Rebecca. Otherwise, uh, the lighting will be dreadful. It'll probably be dreadful anyway, because I'm filming it. All right. Wait, 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 wait. We have a few minutes left. So I can just quickly do this. All right. Now, there's something in the top of the frame. What is it? Oh, there we go. OK. Rebecca, do not laugh at me. You will be in trouble. All right, there is the map. Now, Glendy, am I in the picture? Oh, wait, hang on. Let me do that, then I can see myself. OK. Right, I am in the picture, sort of. Right. OK, everybody. Um, <laughs> Glendy, this is a really important question you've asked. You say, was it always like this? Uh, well, what was the question again? You said, has disease ever played a major part in it? This area here used to be covered in Maasai and cattle and goats. And before the Maasai, it was covered in their ancestors before they were even Maasai. And before that, well, millions of years ago, it was probably covered in the same number of animals that we have here. This is the Serengeti Mara ecosystem. And I know you can't really see the Mara bit of it, but it is up top there. There, you can see it now. Um, and <laughs> well, <laughs> what we have here is this... <laughs> is a situation where in the 1800s, 1890s, what happened was the Italians, who felt that they were missing out on the uh, colonial sort of grab in Italy, thought, well, we'll have Ethiopia or Syria at the time. And they landed in Ethiopia, bearing with them cattle that had a disease called the Rinderpest. That cattle disease, for which the local cattle and wildlife had absolutely no resistance swept through this area all the way down into southern Africa through the Kruger National Park and it wiped out every single Maasai cattle it was. And at a stroke, the Maasai of this area ceased to become pastoralists and they had to become beggars and workers and whatever else they became in order to survive. It also wiped out many uh, wild animal populations, but not quite as badly as it did the cattle. And what that did was to clear this area of wildebeer, at least of cattle and Maasai. And when that happened, what happened was the wildlife population slowly began to come into the area because without the cattle and without the people, the woodlands, I'm just having to lean like this so that I don't look quite so awkward. This probably looks worse. The woodlands started to come back, especially down in the south here and in this region here, the Serengeti, the woodlands came back and those woodlands provided ideal habitat for the tsetse fly, which had been excluded from this area for a very long time. That in turn excluded the Maasai from coming back and excluded their cattle because it made them sick and so the wildlife population started to recover. And then Obviously, you can see it's not a very heavily wooded area now, and there are very few tsetse flies in this region here. There are lots of tsetse flies around this particular area here. But the elephants came in, and they opened it up again. They are a keystone species in this area. They were left unfettered. They returned after the excesses of the hunting that took place here in the, 19, or the, yeah, in the 1800s. They cleared a lot of the wood. They opened up the grasslands. I mean, it's complete grassland down here. There is woodland over here, and over here we have this kind of mixed savanna. And so it provided the ideal habitat, and the wildebeest population recovered to its current levels, I think, around about 1970. And it's remained so uh, pretty much steady since then. So disease has played a major, major role in this ecosystem. Let's go back to... A crossing. There we are. We have Main North now. I apologise for that uh, rather appalling selfie work, but you know sometimes there's just nothing you can do. You can see the wildebeest have now moved away entirely. Uh, Bubble Boy, you were being very rude and wondering why it was that that picture was so dark. It was so dark because I'm afraid I did it on the fly and therefore I didn't lift the gain on the camera, and that's why it was dark. I apologise to that for that bubble boy. Highly critical person. And many of you apparently are new viewers today. Ah, oh, there we go. I've just brightened the picture. That's quite nice. There we go. Many of you are new viewers. Thank you very much for joining us. Please do stick with us. Um, I know that obviously... Um, obviously this is... 
uh, well, shall we say, a technically difficult drive. It's not normally like this at all. And so please do join us again tomorrow and forthwith every single day. Thank you very much for joining us on this technically trying but rather exciting drive. We've had zebra crossing, we've had cheetah attacking, chasing topi, a really beautiful rainstorm and some excellent scenery indeed. So thanks very much for coming along on the ride. Thank you for your questions and comments. And we will, of course, be seeing you tomorrow. Same time, same place, 7.30 East African time, 6.30 African time. Until then, bye-bye.